Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I would like to call this Bloomington City Council meeting to order. Tonight is Monday, January 10th, 2022. Welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll start our meeting as we always do with the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you would please stand and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Once again, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, good to see you all, Council, and members of the staff who are here with us tonight. Mr. Brillard, if you could please call the roll call of the Council. Carter? Present. Coulter? Present. D'Alessandro? Present. Loman? Here. Martin? Here. Nelson? Here. Mayor Bussey? Here. Look at the record show. All seven members of the City Council are present this evening. Next up on our agenda is the approval of tonight's agenda. And just a couple of things to point out in our introductory items. Under item 5.3, we will be uh, uh, having a COVID-19 City Council policy and issue update from Dr. Nick Kelly, and we will be considering a resolution regarding, um, regarding COVID-19 at that point. Our only public hearing tonight is on item 7.1 which is a privately initiated city code amendment regarding a temporary pandemic or emergency service facility as an interim use. Under item eight, our organizational business, our study items, uh, 8.1 is the Dawn Clubhouse replacement and course improvements. We'll be having a discussion on that. Uh, 8.2, the fire station number four project and, um, and bonds process discussion. And then finally, 8.3 is a discussion on local option sales tax. Those will be, as I said, more study information sessions and uh, information from staff and the option or the ability for the council to discuss some of those things. So council, um, any additions or subtractions or corrections to the agenda for this evening? Hearing none, I would move approval of tonight's agenda. Second, council member Lohman. We've got a motion and a second by council member Lohman to approve the agenda for this evening. Hearing no further public and uh, council comment on this. Mr. Brillard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. We've got an agenda. Item four on our agenda is our public comment period, a 20-minute period at each council meeting where we allow residents to come forward and speak to the council on items not on tonight's agenda. We do limit each speaker to five minutes to make sure that everybody has an equal amount of time. And this is an opportunity for the council to listen and to take information from residents we may offer or ask some questions if there are, there's need from clar for clarification or answer some questions if there's some basic uh, factual information that we can provide just to move the discussion along. But otherwise, as I said, it would be a, an opportunity for us to listen. And if need be, we get back to the residents in item 4.1, which is the response to prior meetings public comments. And that's where we'll go right now to start our public comment period is item 4.1, the response to prior meetings public comments Mr. Verbrugge, good evening, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members, good evening. Uh, no follow-up to previous prior or previous public comment at the last council meeting. Very good, thank you much. Council, any questions of Mr. Verbrugge on that? Hearing none, we'll move to item 4.2, which is our public comment period. Uh, 20 minutes, as I said, residents to come forward and to speak on tonight's, any uh, items not on tonight's agenda. Now, uh, we I know we've got three callers who have called in. Uh, we also, I believe, have at least a couple of people or at least one person here in the, uh, the audience who wishes to speak. So why don't we uh, go with the folks here in person first. So um, we will start. If you, good evening. If you could identify yourself. I, I know you've already signed in. Good evening, Mr. Hi, Abel, welcome. Uh, well, uh, City Council Mayor, City Manager Administration, my name is Rick Oliva. I'm a lifelong Bloomington resident and former school board member and also former city council candidate. However, the last race didn't go how I had planned. So instead of being up there with all of you folks, I will make my case from back here. I was originally gonna speak tonight about earned sick and safe leave, uh, but that'll have to wait until next meeting because something else caught my attention this week that I wanted to bring to your attention. Some people on social media were commenting about the salary range for a current job posting and I don't really know how much a community outreach and engagement manager normally makes, so I don't really have much of an opinion on that. But what troubles me is the last paragraph of the posting, which reads, the city of Bloomington 
is an equal opportunity employer and actively seeks a diverse workforce that reflects the community we serve. Applicants who are black, indigenous, or persons of color are encouraged to apply. We also encourage women, veterans, members of the LGBTQIA community, and individuals with disabilities to apply. Now, I have been speaking out against institutionalized racism in Bloomington and the divides created by some of the, what I would consider well-intentioned but misguided solutions to it for at least the past decade. And this end note is about as egregious as it gets. You are literally encouraging anyone who is not an able-bodied heterosexual white male to apply. Unless he's a veteran, then he can apply. And really you show preference to anyone who is not white. You encourage BIPOC first, then there's a period. And in the next sentence, it's like, yeah, we also encourage women and LGBTQIA and, and also dis disabled people uh, to apply. And what happens is now you've created a situation where if a black man, a white woman, and a white man, including myself, I'm a, a member of the BIPOC community, if we all apply for this job and the black man is hired, or if I'm hired, people will look back and question whether or not it was because of his race or because he was the most qualified. You can say you don't hire people based on race all day. I even spoke with Faith Jackson, the racial equity coordinator for Bloomington, who said the city doesn't hire based on race. But your job posting clearly states who you're looking for, and it's not white people. Being a member of the BIPOC community myself, I can tell you that you don't have to encourage us to apply for jobs, especially ones paying six figures. Someone's expecting that much money, then they already know how, that's, how this works. I personally would also feel uncomfortable applying for a job with this language in the posting because I would question the organization's values and I wouldn't want to be in a situation where people question my qualifications because the organization was trying to fill a quota. And it's not just me. I know I lost the election, so maybe my opinion doesn't matter that much to you, but the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission published a letter on April 8, 2008 that states, to develop an applicant pool that reflects the demographics of the qualified labor force, it may be necessary to encourage members of underrepresented groups to apply. However, later on it says, seeking a particular kind of applicant denotes a preference for that group. It is not just encouraging people to submit applications. Thus, seeking persons on a protected basis, such as race or gender, would violate EEOC enforced laws. The city's job posting says you are actively seeking to diversify, then list the groups encouraged to apply, presumably to achieve your diversity goal. Whether or not you agree with me, I think if you're a challenge in court, you would lose. What I would like to see is for this in all racist, sexist, or other language that suggests individuals will be hired for any reason other than their qualifications be removed from your job postings. And uh, more importantly, I'd like you to take comprehens a, a comprehensive look at your hiring practices and racial equity plans and make sure your decisions are based on merit and need and not racial quotas. Questions I'd like answered in a follow-up would be what factors does the city use when hiring? Specifically, does the city use race, gender, or any other factor outside of merit for hiring as maybe as a tiebreaker? And if the answer is no, how do you expect people to trust that you don't hire based on factors other than merit when your job postings and other actions the city has taken in the name of equity, such as using race as a factor in delegating resources in your park master plan, suggest otherwise? So thank you. I uh, look forward to your response. Thank you, Mr. Oliva. I think we have your, the questions that you laid out there. Thank you much. We'll have those answered at the next meeting. I think you have my contact informa information, too. We know how to track you down. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. I know, as I said, we've got three callers on the line, and unfortunately, I don't think we know exactly the, uh, based on the, the system that we're using, we don't know exactly who we're calling on. So we're gonna call on our three different callers one at a time, and uh, have them come forward and give them their five minutes. So, uh, Mr. Sable, can you help us out there? Sure, I have a, a phone caller with the prefix 612218. I'm going to unmute you so you can share your comments. And you should be Hi, able to speak. Angela. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, this is Angela Coyle. Good evening, Ms. Coyle. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council. Tonight, I would like to talk about ESSL, the Earned Sick and Safe Leave Policy Proposal that is winding its way through the task force. In last week's meeting, I was literally shaking my head at the discussion around ESSL. 
So I decided to take a closer look at just who is on this task force that you appointed. I found that it includes three far left advocacy groups and even one business, Butter Bakery, that isn't even located in Bloomington. This is a task force that cannot be taken seriously when it comes to setting policy that affects over 1,100 businesses based in Bloomington. While there are some legitimate businesses on the task force like Radisson Blue, I cannot see how having far left advocacy groups on the task force is fair representation for all of Bloomington. At least have groups from the other side of the spectrum as well, like Americans for Prosperity, which is very active in Minnesota. All of Bloomington can see that this so-called task force reflects the anti-business ideological bend of the mayor and the city council. This is not the first time that you, the mayor and city council, have promoted policies that are anti-business. Last year, the flavored tobacco ban was passed even though no miners purchased flavored tobacco here. 97% of the police department sting operations were successful meaning cashiers stopped undercover officers from purchasing all tobacco products. The ban not only violates rights of grown adults to buy tobacco products of their choice, it disproportionately hurts BIPOC owners of small shops that depend on this revenue to bring in foot traffic, making upwards of 30 to 40% of their revenue. I think it would be fair to say that your flavored tobacco ban is an example of systemic racism, since it effectively causes severe economic harm to BIPOC-owned businesses or worse, puts them out of business altogether. So why should Bloomington not have a mandatory ESL policy? First, it's unnecessary. Employees are already favoring companies that include sick leave coverage in their benefit packages. In the last three months of 2021, over 13 million Americans left their jobs for better opportunities and better benefit packages. For the smaller mom and pop stores who cannot afford a more robust benefit package, including ESSL, they may be more limited in their ability to recruit and retain employees, but that's their choice. Second, these smaller employers can ill afford the added payroll costs, headcount, and administrative burdens to monitor a heavy-handed ESSL policy. What do you think will happen? They will resort to laying off employees who can least afford to lose their jobs or who are otherwise happy where they are. Many of these are BIPOC residents who will once again be punished by gleamy-eyed politicians with solutions out looking for problems. From regressive tax increases to anti-business policies which end up hurting business owners and our BIPOC population, our mayor and city council seem to have a fundamental misunderstanding of economics and end up hurting the very people groups they trip over themselves trying to help. Maybe a firm no from the business community will cause you to reconsider this unnecessary regressive policy called ESL. Start by representing BIPOC groups and frankly all of Bloomington's, not working against them with tax increases and anti-business ordinances. Start 2022 by actually doing your job and representing Bloomington. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Coyle. Mr. Sable. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I have a caller with the prefix 612-987. Six, um, six you are now unmuted and able to speak. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, am I? Hi, thank you. Um, tonight, I'm addressing concerns with a May 2017 joint statement made by the City of Bloomington 
school. Ms. Ness, if I could, if I could just interrupt, if I could just interrupt for oh. just a second, if I could have, I, uh, we, I know it's you, but for the record, if you could please identify yourself, Sally, just so we have it officially on the record that it is you calling in. Thank you, Sally Ness. All right, okay, thank you. So Go ahead. Tonight I am address. Okay, <laughs> tonight I am addressing concerns with the May 2017 joint statement made by the city and Bloomington schools that the Star Tribune reported quote was prepared in response to reports of intimidation or targeting of immigrants in the city, quote, unquote. And the m members of the community, quote, have shared their, they've either been bullied or possibly harassed, unquote. The data indicates differently. June 1st, 2017, there's an email from a police officer asking a city staff member to clarify the statement that was made in the Star Tribune on May 31st, 2017. It appears from the data the staff member is the person who initiated the statement. The email states, quote, I am wondering if you could make some clarification in regard to statements made in the article referring to being harassed and bullied and reports of intimidation or targeting of immigrants in the city. Are these events taking place solely at ISD 271 schools, or was there any reference at this meeting to Bloomington police officers with these community groups outside the walls of our Bloomington schools? The email continues, quote, also the same question in regard to your quoted statement, these last several months, there have been a lot of fear and anxiety in our community as it relates to immigration. Is there a Bloomington police connection with this quote? June 1st, 2017, the city staff member responds, to my knowledge, and does not provide specific information. There was no specific reports that generated the statement. Instead, there are emails that state the need to address concerns due to the election results. November 17, 2016, email states, quote, I am not aware of anything that we are doing as a city council as a whole, but from a community engagement perspective, we are organizing an immigration forum to address the concerns and fears of our immigrant community in light of the election results. November 23rd, 2016, email states, quote, he says the concern is not so much about Trump, but the Republican tr control of Congress and what they can do to the immigration regulations. December 12, 2016, email states, this is in response to many fears and concerns expressed by members of our community as a result of the elections. March 2nd, 2017, email states, asked what, if anything, the city council, city, city council is doing to address the concerns in the immigrant community given the Trump administration's actions around immigration. The email continues about making a formal statement which some other districts have already done. March 29, 2017, email states, the city of Bloomington recognizes that noticeable concerns, fears, and needs have arisen in the community as a result of the recent federal executive orders that relate to immigration. The goal is to understand how the city can effectively respond to the impact of the federal executive orders that relate to immigration. April 14, 2017, email states, a couple of us spoke on immigration issues after the monthly CCH meeting. I think the biggest issue right now is creating a safe zone for immigrants, especially undocumented ones. May 16, 2017, email states, regarding the community statement about the possibility of having a couple of community members provide some testimony to the council and board. There was one person who provided testimony, which the Star Tribune reported as reports of Islamophobia in Bloomington schools, such as students pulling off hijabs or head coverings of young girls. I requested data from Bloomington schools, and the first response I was received was, I am not aware of any staff reports of incidents of Islamophobia in our schools. I made another request, specifically pointing out the testimony and was informed again there were no incidents of Islamophobia. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Ms. Ness. Mr. Sable, I believe we have one more caller. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I have a caller with the call in uh, user number uh, 402689. I'm going to unmute you. If you could please identify yourself. My name is Jody Johnson. I am with GS Labs. We are currently at the Mall of America doing COVID testing. I believe that one of the city planners is speaking on our behalf, Michael Centenario. 
Yes, I, I think. I, are, are you uh, on the line tonight? Are you looking to talk about the public hearing item 7.1, the privately initiated code amendment, temporary pandemic or emergency no. service facilities? No, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I am just simply on the call. Um, I, I was just going to sit in and listen. Oh, okay. okay. For for the for like I said, Mike is um, speaking on our behalf. I believe. Copy. Okay. Wonderful. All right. We 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 were mistaken. I'm sorry. We thought you might be wishing to speak on our public comment period on item four point two. <laughs> nope. Nope. Okay. okay. Thank you. Just stay on the line then, and uh, we'll get to that actually here shortly. Thanks. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, I do have another caller number, 952-261. I will unmute and let the caller identify themselves. Thank you. It's David Clark. Good evening, Mr. Clark. Good evening, dear Mayor Bissy and uh, City Council. Good evening. First, I want to wish you all a happy new year. Hopefully, it'll be a good year for all of us. And then also offer the uh, Verbrugge family my sincere condolences. As my time is short, I want to just recap the end of the meeting last week when the council and the mayor issued their wish list for the new year. In that recap, many familiar themes were heard, including public safety, which is at the top of everyone's mind. I was also pleased to hear Mr. Nelson state that fiscal responsibility is a priority for him in 2022. And uh, shout out to Ms. Carter who mentioned human trafficking as a priority, especially given that January is National Human Trafficking Prevention Month. I have personal knowledge of dozens of our students in our schools who are victims of trafficking, as well as the Mall of America and our city boundaries, which serves as an exchange point for trafficking, along with uh, the airport, which is the eighth largest in the country. These are issues that everyone can agree on and get behind, uh, public safety, fiscal responsibility, and uh, human trafficking. So since you had a chance to issue your wish list for 2022, I thought I would provide you with some of Bloomington's priorities which are on our list. First, start governing for all the residents and abandon your grievances-based approach to governance. The last two years have taken us down a road of issue after issue where you've kowtowed to the special interests who donated to your campaigns. You're bought and paid for by outside groups and out-of-state donors as evidenced by the financial reports from the Secretary of State. Those will be finalized this month and we'll see what the final tallies are. Issues like rain choice voting, which was thrust upon us as a way to increase candidate choices, and yet you only ran one candidate in each district last year. That was a major head fake to the residents of Bloomington, which caused great confusion and ended up violating voters their rights to a free and fair election. Another one was uh, conversion therapy, which wasn't even happening in Bloomington, according to Molly Bosu, chair of the Human Rights Commission. And yet you passed a ban on reparative, reparative therapy anyway violating the parental rights of tens of thousands of Bloomington parents, and then sticking us with a bill for extra staff to monitor this non-issue, this manufactured crisis. Then you banned flavored tobacco in Bloomington in order to protect our youth who weren't even buying it, according to our own police department. Out of 68 sting operations, 67 were successful in the cashier preventing a purchase of any kind of tobacco. So it never was about protecting our youth. You passed an ordinance because you just thought flavored tobacco was bad for people stripping people of their rights as adults to purchase a legal, enjoyable product, which is sold by many shops owned by BIPOC and, and legal immigrants. You are literally doing financial harm to the very people groups that you purport to protect. In my book, that is at best hypocritical. Second, scale back your tax and spending binge, which will soon paint Bloomington into a corner of diminishing returns. Not that Bloomington can't have nice things. We just can't have all the nice things that you're, you're dreaming up and soaking the residents with taxes to pay for it. The appropriately named loss to local option sales tax is your next honeypot that you want to crack open, freeing up tens of millions to pay for your largesse. In the meantime, people of color, immigrants, retirees, single moms, working families, they're all paying for this. The people you who can least afford it, the perfect storm of inflation, increased taxes, a spending binge and a growing population in need of special services will soon back us into a corner we cannot get out of. Mark my words. Now, I could go on and on, and I would be doing a deeper dive into each of these issues above, but the message is this from the residents of Bloomington. Start governing for everyone and get your tax and spend under control. We see the wacky ideas already surfacing, like shutting down our streets for bikeways or prohibiting residents from mowing their lawns in, maize, in May so the bees can pollinate. But those are small potatoes compared to the bigger issue of governance in tax and spend. Start the year off right. Change these things and it will go well for you. Otherwise, it's going to be a long year ahead for everyone. Trust me. 
Our former mayor is having a name, a street named after him because he governed from the center and did what was right for everyone. I think that should be our model in 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Mr. Sable, anyone else on the line wishing to speak? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I do not have any other callers wishing to speak at Open Forum. Very good. Last call for anybody in the chambers for item 4.2, public comment period. Seeing no one coming forward, I will close tonight's public comment period, and we will move on. We will move on on our agenda. We will move on to item five, our introductory items, and item 5.1, which is a proclamation. So I'm going to head down to the dais to read the Martin Luther King Day Jr. Proclamation. Example of static electricity is what we just saw there. Our proclamation tonight is for Martin Luther King Jr. Day, which is January 17th, 2022. Um, we've uh, celebrated this here in the city of Bloomington, I think since 1986, I believe, is when the, the official first time that the city of Bloomington celebrated this. And uh, once again, a proclamation on behalf of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, and I will read it now. Proclamation for Martin Luther King Jr. Day, January 17th, 2022. Whereas Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the leader of the modern civil rights movement in the United States, was born on January 15th, 1929 in Atlanta, Georgia. And whereas Dr. King devoted his life to advancing civil rights and public service. And whereas Dr. King's message evolved over time from one of basic civil rights, of voting and desegregation, to advancing labor rights, economic and social justice, and peace and dignity for all. And whereas Dr. King looked forward to the day when everyone would be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And whereas Dr. King's dream continues to inspire our nation and, not, and is just as important today as it was in the 1960s. And whereas there are many goals that the city of Bloomington must realize in order to achieve the city council's strategic priority of inclusion and equity for all residents. And whereas Dr. King was assassinated on April 4th, 1968, and after 15 years of advocacy, Martin Luther King Jr. Day was signed into law in 1983 and first celebrated as a federal holiday in 1986, but was not officially observed in all 50 states until the year 2000. Now therefore I, Mayor Tim Bussey, do hereby proclaim January 17th, 2022 as Martin Luther King Jr. Day in Bloomington and encourage all residents to honor and remember Dr. King for his humanita humanitarian values and to work toward their realization by attending the National Day of Racial Healing virtual event on January 18th from 6 to 8 p.m. when the City of Bloomington will partner with the cities of Edina and Golden Valley and the Healing Justice Foundation to host a community discussion on creating a more just and equitable world. Signed this day, the 10th of January, 2022. So as I said, once again, this year we're honoring Dr. Martin Luther King, and I would uh, ask people to, to take to heart that invitation to join us on Tuesday, January 18th for the National Day of Racial Healing. Uh, as I said, the city of Bloomington, we're going to mark the occasion with an online community discussion from 6 to 8 p.m. featuring the Healing Justice Foundation's president and CEO, Dr. Joy Lewis. The event is sponsored in partnership with the cities of Edina and Golden Valley. Check out the city's website for registration information, and please do join us. So thank you all so very much, and I will return. Dr. Claiborne, I apologize. I, I forgot that you were on the phone joining us this evening. My apologies. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Mr. I am Mary so Mr. sorry. I am, it's so odd with, with one person in the council chambers looking back at me and not having a council chambers full of folks, including yourself. So I do apologize. Thank you for joining us this evening. I accept it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, I do accept um, the Martin Luther King proclamation as was read. And I'd like to say good evening to Mr. Mayor and the city council members as well. I don't know if this is my opportunity just to share. Please. Okay, yes. Um, I wanted to share, I'm actually from Greenwood, Mississippi. My husband and I moved here um, in 2000, so it's been 21 years. So we definitely grew up in the deep south and 
um, in the 70s and 80s. Um, so we, we're accustomed to some segregation and di dis uh, discrimination um, in the schools. I actually went to a high school that was um, segregated and I graduated in 86, believe it or not. Um, so um, I wanted to share one of my favorite lines from a sermon that Dr. King um, preached in 1957 at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, where he said a line spoken um, that says, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Um, so just growing up in the South um, and seeing the impact that Dr. King has had on my life and so many others as well, um, uh, created opportunities, gave me a voice to vote, to go to college and get my doctorate degree, um, coming from such a, a small place and moving to this wonderful city of Bloomington um, where my husband and I, he's a pastor of the Potter's House of Jesus Christ, which is located 8000 Portland Avenue South here in Bloomington, Minnesota. And we've been here ministering for um, 21 years coming up now. Um, I'm very blessed to be in a city where there is diversity and love. Um, I feel love from all of my neighbors and different races of people. Um, so keep up the awesome work to our mayor and city council members and the residents of Bloomington. Um, and I just wanted to share, um, you know, that Dr. King's life has definitely impacted so many of us. And if we continue to use love and light, um, we'll see a difference um, in our society and our community. Um, and once again, I'd just like to thank the mayor and the city council members for this opportunity to share um, may God bless you, and I'm looking forward to a wonderful um, 2022 year. Thank you. Thank you for your reflection, Dr. Claiborne, and your, your kind words about the city as well. And uh, thank you for your two decades worth of work uh, with this, in the city of Bloomington, uh, preaching, reaching out, connecting people. It is uh, greatly appreciated. And so, so thank you so very much for the influence you have had on this community and, and the people across this community. Um, it is, it is uh, deeply appreciated, so thank you so very much. You're welcome. Thank you. And my apologies once again for... Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you much. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Next on our agenda is item 5.2, which is our introduction of new employees. We want to take uh, advantage of the opportunity at our public meetings to introduce our new employees who are working not only with staff and with uh, the city council, but also certainly will be working in the public. And we want to make sure that the public has an opportunity to, to meet them virtually before they meet them face to face, either across a desk or out in the field or across a telephone. So. We have, I think, three people this evening that we're going to introduce, and our Public Works Director, Carl Keel, is going to do those introductions. Good evening, Mr. Keel. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, this evening, it's my pleasure to introduce to you three new civil engineering technicians within our engineering department. Uh, these are the folks that, during the winter, uh, design and draft uh, public improvement, street projects, sewer projects, etc. And then in the summer, they're the folks that are out in the field uh, inspecting that work and administering those contracts to get those improvements built. Um, we are a bit challenged in the next couple years uh, with a lot of retirements of very long-term employees that, that fill these positions. And so we've been hiring uh, a rather large number of engineering technicians over the past years. Um, it's an area that's uh, very competitive, and I'm very happy to say that the three folks that we're introducing to you this evening are quite high quality, and we're excited to have them. Uh, so I'll start with the Shugri Ahmed. Uh, I think is yeah, Shugri's on. I see. Uh, Shugri uh, was born in Ethiopia, in the Somali region of Ethiopia, on the eastern side of Ethiopia. He came to the United States when he was 15 years old, uh, and graduated from Wilmer High School. Uh, and then went on to the University of Minnesota, where this past spring he received a civil engineering degree. Um, he's uh, an avid soccer and basketball fan. And uh, again, we're very excited that he's chose to 
begin his career here in the city of Bloomington. So, Shugri. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, happy New Year, and I'm grateful and uh, I'm grateful for this job opportunity, and I'm looking forward to take to uh, make best out of it. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you, Shugri. Thank you for for being with us this evening. Look forward to meeting you face to face, and and. Uh, uh, do eventually, I, I'd, I'd be interested in the story, how you made your way from uh, Ethiopia to Wilmer, Minnesota. I'd be curious to hear that story, but uh, I look forward to meeting you in person as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. So next employee I'd like to introduce is Zach Durkison. Uh, Zach grew up in Gold, Cold Spring, Minnesota, and uh, he started his career in public works on the contractor side and worked for a number of, of contractors in the Twin Cities area, worked on paving crews and with excavation companies. Um, then he decided, I think after all that work, decided that maybe he ought to go to school and, and earned his diploma in surveying and civil engineering from St. Cloud Technical Community College. Um, he has worked for MnDOT and then kind of worked his way from outstate MnDOT to Metro District of MnDOT. Um, Zach, I think, enjoys anything outdoors, uh, but his favorite is ice fishing. So uh, a fun fact for, for Zach is that uh, he has been to and enjoyed over 100 craft breweries. So with that, I'd like to welcome Zach. Good evening, Zach. Hi, good evening. Yeah, um, that's right. Yep, I've worked my way to the Metro and um, looking forward to working in Bloomington and this upcoming construction season. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for, for joining us this evening. Thanks for your interest in, in making your way to Bloomington here. And I'm, boy, but from Wilbur to Cold Spring, we are rocking West Central Minnesota tonight. Well done, and it's good to hear. Right. Well, our final one is not from West Central Minnesota. Uh, Alexander Poor, he uh, grew up just south of us in, in Burnsville. Um, he's a graduate from Burnsville High School, and he attended college at the University of North Dakota and at uh, Dakota County Technical uh, college. Um, would note that uh, Alex is actually a son of one of our long-term employees in our utilities division. Uh, Randy Poor is a supervisor in our utilities position for over 40 years, so uh, we know he comes from good stock. Um, he has worked previously with a number of local uh, engineering firms and uh, uh, enjoys mountain biking, hiking, camping, and fishing. And fun fact uh, for Alex, at his young age, he's been already to Belize four times. That's in Central Central America. So welcome, welcome, Alex. Yeah, uh, Happy New Year to everybody. And uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone at the city for extending this opportunity to me. And I look forward to the coming construction year and the design work we've done already has been uh, entertaining and I enjoy it. So uh, looking forward to the future work that I'm gonna do at the city. Well, happy new year to you, Alex. Thank you much. Uh, glad to have you here with us tonight and um, glad you're continuing the, the family legacy working here in the city of Bloomington. Well done. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Mr. Keel, thank you for the introductions and um, looking forward, I, I think this is this is an interesting and enjoyable part of our, our evening to be able to meet our new employees. And, and as I have said to everyone, I look forward to meeting people face to face here in the, in the council chambers at some point in the very near future or, or just in city hall, just in general. So, but thanks for being with us this evening, everybody. Um, stay warm. Thank you, Mayor. Moving on to item 5.3 on our agenda, which is a COVID-19 council update from Dr. Nick Kelly, who of course is our public health, uh, the director of our public health department here in the city of Bloomington. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, when we started talking about the agenda, uh, as part of this presentation, I'm gonna ask the council to consider a resolution uh, regarding COVID-19 and encouraging our residents to follow all CDC and Department of Health guidelines regarding COVID-19. So we can have that discussion as we get past this. But for now, uh, I want to turn it over to Dr. Kelly to give us an update and to lead us into this discussion. Good evening, Dr. Kelly. Good evening, Mayor, uh, Council Members. I'm going to share a couple of slides tonight to help 
kind of set the context for, for what we're seeing right now in Minnesota. I do look forward to the day where I'm here talking about other public health issues, but I'm here again to provide you another update on COVID and bracing myself for the coming weeks. Here in Minnesota, we're seeing a surge in COVID-19 cases unlike anything we've seen before. Bloomington is currently at a little over 1,200 cases per 100,000 persons in the last seven days, the largest number uh, that we've ever seen in this course of this pandemic. And you'll see in this graph, uh, the far right side, it looks like the numbers are coming down a little. That's an artifact of our data system. Uh, so the last seven days is uh, very variable. Uh, that peak is a little over 1,200 cases uh, per 100,000 over the last seven days. To put it in context, the CDC considers anything above 100 cases per 100,000 a significant community spread. You all remember uh, the peak we saw at the end of 2020. Uh, that peak was at 751 cases per 100,000 for context. And if we look at the number of days where we've had uh, some of our record setting case numbers per day, eight of the last 10 largest single day case, case counts have come since December 27th forward. We're seeing case rates increase among children and receiving reports about challenges. This shows you the, the challenges we're seeing here in our neighbors in Edina and Richfield, but the challenges we're seeing um, in children and in school age areas we're receiving reports across the metro of schools and childcare staff and challenges, bus driver shortages, operational disruptions to childhood and early learning programs. You'll see in this graph, we've seen a, a, a significant increase in, in cases across all age ranges, especially looking at uh, some of our younger uh, age ranges, that's the lighter blue. Um, and we've also seen that increase in some of our uh, older populations. So our 60 to 69 and 70 plus populations have seen a pretty marked increase in the last few weeks. Uh, that's something that we're monitoring and concerned about. Omicron spreads more easily than other strains of COVID with this increase in infections likely due to two things, increased transmissibility, meaning it spreads easier between humans and improved immune evasion, meaning it can sidestep the defenses in our body from prior infection or vaccination. This means we're going to see a larger number of breakthrough infections among those that are fully vaccinated than we've seen so far. Case counts are one measure of what's happening during a surge, but it's important to note that testing limitations lead to case counts being less reliable indicators. Our main focus now is going to be on hospitalizations, ICU stays, and deaths to assess the impact in our community. And when we look at hospitalizations, we see Bloomington's hospitalizations been going up since October. We're concerned about that increase, but we are also not seeing the significant increase in ICU usage that we've seen in previous uh, waves with COVID. We remain in a critical situation uh, with ICU and hospital bed capacity. As of this morning, there was one adult ICU bed available in the Twin Cities Metro and six pediatric beds available. We can all take actions to support our healthcare system in addition to following COVID-19 precautions. We're making it, we're asking the public to play it safe over the next few weeks. Wear your seatbelt, make sure your kids are in their car seats securely. Don't take unnecessary risks. For example, if you wanna use a chainsaw, do you absolutely have to do that? Walk carefully in icy areas, get your flu shot and give blood. We're in a critical shortage of blood right now in the Metro. With so many people becoming ill at the same time, we also expect to see impacts on our workforces and city infrastructure. Many organizations and agencies are already reporting more staff out sick than in any other time in this pandemic. For example, waste management last week had trouble picking up trash in several cities here in the Twin Cities Metro due to sick staff. And there's delays in people getting prescriptions, challenging getting healthcare appointments. We expect things to continue and they're likely gonna get worse as the surge peaks, likely sometime toward the end of January. As a city, we've taken the following actions. Uh, we have remote meetings like we're doing tonight. City council, all boards and commissions move to remote meetings pursuant to state statute 13D.021. All city staff that can work at home are working at home. We've required masks in city facilities. 
We're working on additional messaging with community partners to support community members in the next few weeks. We're hosting additional COVID-19 vaccine clinics, including one tomorrow at City Hall. Staff are working tirelessly to support community during this time. We're supplying rapid tests and respirators to staff supporting critical operations in coordination with emergency management at the city. And we have a proposed resolution for action from city council here tonight. Well, this is a lot of bad news at a stressful time when people are exhausted and we all want COVID just to be done, there is hope. The first thing that's giving me hope is that we aren't where we were a year ago. The community we serve and live in is highly vaccinated with 80% of those five and older living in Bloomington being fully vaccinated. For these individuals, we can expect strong protection against severe illness. At the same time, this doesn't cover everyone in our community, which is why we're dependent upon several mitigation measures. There are still children under five who cannot be vaccinated, older adults and those who have immune systems that are not producing a robust response to vaccines. And we need to come together to protect all of them. Be prepared to help your friends, family, neighbors, and networks during this coming weeks. People may need meal deliveries, help picking up medication or other supports. Work together with your block captains next door, texting your neighbors, other ways to stay in touch with the people that matter in your life and have a plan to support them in the coming weeks. I have hope because while this surge is going to look different, we know we can help each other and we can do this as a community to get through it. Our tools haven't changed, and if anything, we have more of them right now. We're going to get through this tough time. Things will get better, and we're going to have to take care of ourselves so we can keep taking care of each other in the community. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Uh, I believe as you started, I, I apologize. I, I neglected to, to introduce and welcome also uh, Blair Harrison, who's Assistant Public Health Administrator, is also joining us this evening. So thank you for being here. Council, questions of Dr. Kelly. Uh, I, I, I have one. I mean, the, the case count numbers are astounding and not in a good way astounding. And can you talk at all, Dr. Kelly, about how those numbers are affected by the take-home testing that is going on? Uh, the number of folks who may be testing positive at home as opposed to in an official capacity, is it possible those numbers are actually lower than what the true count is? Uh, Mayor Bussey, we, we actually believe those case counts are a, a significant undercount. Um, there is a lot of rapid testing occurring in the community, and those tests are not reported to the State Health Department and are reflected in this data. So the, the likelihood of all of us, I know personally I've heard more people in this entire pandemic the last two weeks have tested positive with rapid tests. They don't report them to the State Health Department. They're not in this data. So we know the numbers are substantially higher than what they currently are with this data. As I said, astounding and, and not in a good way, not at all. Councilmember Nelson, question. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. I am, uh, just for clarification, our dashboard um, lists the uh, current at something like 800, you're at 1,200. It looked like the data that they were using was uh, based on January 1st on the dashboard. So I'm assuming some things have come in since January 1st. Can you just try to explain that to me? And it sounds like um, there's been a couple of spikes there uh, right after Christmas and right after New Year's. Am I understanding the data correctly? Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilmember Nason. Um, you are absolutely correct. The dashboard on the city's website is updated on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Thursday's data included data that was through uh, Wednesday, essentially the close of business on Wednesday when we pull it down Thursday morning. What we continue to see is a rapid uh, pulling of the data statewide. So the data, for instance, we pulled down this morning was still including data for the last seven days being added to the case counts. And so that number, we have jumped up that much in that short period of time. Um, and then just one other question similar to uh, the mayor's question. Um, do you have any information about people taking tests 
and testing negative, um, even though the symptoms seem to be very, very similar to COVID, including, um, uh, I'll be honest, my daughter who uh, was sick and uh, could not uh, taste things, could not smell things, um, yet tested negative. Um, she's isolated and, and uh, all of that just to be safe, but um, do you have any information for that? Because I've heard other people have that a similar story along those lines. Dr. Kelly? Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Nelson, um, I hope your daughter is doing well and thank you for, for following guidance and having her isolate. That That is something that we are seeing um, and there's some concern with the, the ability of rapid tests to detect uh, COVID as uh, on the early side of it. Um, often what we see individuals will test as soon as symptoms start, it's negative, they then think, oh, it's not COVID. The recommendations are you test, often it's about uh, 36 hours after the first test is negative with a second test and still being symptomatic, then you recommend it to go get a PCR. That's not always doable right now with the testing volume we're seeing, but uh, early early on in the onset of symptoms, rapid tests may not be um, as sensitive uh, as they are later in the onset of symptoms. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kelly. And you touched on my last question that I have for you is, I know there's um, been very long lines for our testing in Bloomington. I believe the airport, airport is now requiring appointments. What are your recommendations for getting tested if you're sick? Should people go in and get tested? Should they just do the isolation? Um, I guess, what are you recommending or what are, what are the health uh, recommendations now if people aren't feeling well? Mr. Okay. Mayor, Councilmember Nelson, um, we recommend people try to get tested. Um, and so it is. It can be a challenge to get access to either a rapid test or uh, the community testing sites. Uh, many people also have access through their health systems. Uh, they're standing up additional testing capacity, and a lot of our local pharmacies also have testing capacity. So there, there are resources out there, and and if somebody is not able to access those resources then and they have symptoms they should take action to isolate themselves and protect their their community uh, for those five or however many days they have symptoms uh, to protect others thank you appreciate your time councilmember loman thank you mayor just a few questions here uh, uh for you uh it um you mentioned block captain uh, for those folks who are new to the city. Is there a way for 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 us to figure out, uh, you know, who my block captain is, or maybe manager could assist with that? You just mentioned that in your uh, remarks, and I want to just be sure if someone was thinking that that would be a resource. Uh... Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman. I think uh, if somebody has a question about whether there is a neighborhood watch program in their neighborhood, uh, it's best to call the City of Bloomington Police Department and um, speak uh, to uh, Katie Zurl is our coordinator for that program. And uh, Katie will be able to connect folks uh, if there is indeed a watch program in their neighborhood. And if not, maybe provide information if somebody's interested in starting a neighborhood watch program. Thank you, Council Member Lohman. Sure, I just want to be sure that we're us folks who've been around for a while. I, I know who it is, but you know, uh, <laughs> you may not necessarily know who that is. Um, I had a question also from a resident, Nick, uh, that had asked about uh, uh, CDC requirements. And are there any CDC requirements in terms of uh, vaccination uh, cards or that type of thing uh, that they're recommending for cities to to move forward with uh, in terms of? Uh, uh, within the city of Bloomington, I know we're looking at those recommendations. Are, are there anything that, that's uh, of that nature that uh, uh, that is being recommended? Dr. Kelly, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Lohman, uh, the the CDC's recommendations are for everybody to be vaccinated over the age of five, um, and so there are some uh, ways people are doing that, operationalizing that around uh, the country. Uh, to increase that and encourage people to be vaccinated into spaces. 
Uh, the CDC's guidance is anybody over the age of five should be vaccinated, and most people over the age of 12 are now eligible for boosters and should have those too. And then um, uh, around uh, masking, I, I've heard some uh, uh, deliberation and conversation about the effectiveness of certain masks. Would you want to opine at all uh, on the types of masks that uh, they are being recommended to be uh, worn uh, in public? Dr. Kelly. Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilmember Lohman. So masks uh, are a, a slew of, uh, there's a wide range of what masks are out there. And so we started off this pandemic with shortages and challenges getting respiratory protection. And the, the goal was to get people to uh, minimize droplet and, and other transmission means. And so people were encouraged to wear cloth uh, to make masks do what they could to minimize risks. Our supply chains have ample capacity and there's wide availability of higher quality uh, respiratory protection. And so the CDC in September uh, updated their guidance and basically said, if you're at higher risk in places of high transmission, you should consider upgrading your respiratory protection to something that uh, not only protects the people around you, but protects you by filtering and minimizing what you're breathing in. Because that's how people are getting COVID is, is they're breathing in air and getting sick that way. And so the recommendation is to, if you can and are able to wear what we would consider more of a respirator, which is a, uh, a higher quality mask that provides a tight fit and high filtration to prevent somebody from inhaling COVID in the environment they're in. Uh, finally here, um, uh, uh, this has been going on for some time. When do we know we're going to be back to normal? Uh, when, when, when will the signs be that we're, we're going back to normal? Dr. Kelly? Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilmember Lohman, uh, that is, uh, I'm not sure a million dollar question is, is the appropriate way to determine that. Uh, that is the question everybody's trying to figure out. The reality that we're going to see with COVID is, is COVID is not going to go away, but it is going to go uh, similar to what we see with other infectious diseases where it becomes something that we've come to terms with and can manage living with. So we, we often will say that's endemic, um, that basically it means our mitigations, our tools, and the cost in human illness, death, and suffering that we're willing to bear kind of determine our, our path forward. We see something similar to that with influenza, where we see a, a range of deaths, cases, and hospitalizations every year on a seasonal pattern that the U.S. is willing to accept. We don't see the seasonality with COVID right now. And... Uh, Many of my colleagues, myself included, are, are kind of stunned often that we're having conversations where we're wondering, well, how are we going to move forward or, or get through? And we've lost well over 800,000 Americans to this virus so far. And we're going to find that transition. Um, I don't know if it's going to be a few months or, or more. Uh, the next month and a half are going to be a challenge. At some point, it's going to be everybody's going to either get sick or vaccinated, and we're going to have a level of immunity and some protection to weather the future challenges we see with COVID in a better place. Um, and our, our mitigations and our processes, the ways we've changed buildings with HVAC systems, the idea of wearing respiratory protection, especially during cold and flu season, and minimizing that, not going to work sick, some of these things may become part of uh, the way we move forward. Council, additional questions? Hearing none, uh, I, I've mentioned a couple of times now, Council, uh, we have a resolution in our packet 
encouraging Bloomington to follow COVID-19 safety guidance. And I'm sure you all had a chance to, to look through it and to read it. And just for the uh, benefit of the folks at home, uh, after a series of whereas statements to build the case, the, the now therefore be it resolved includes the following things. First and foremost is to diligently follow COVID-19 safety guidance, which includes get vaccinated and boosted, which includes wear an N95, KN95, KF94, or high quality mask. Get tested if you've had close contact with someone with COVID-19. Stay home when you're sick and comply with the Minnesota Department of Health isolation and quarantine guidance. It also includes uh, to encourage entities open to the public to require mask wearing of their patrons and staff and provide masks to those in need at low or no cost. To encourage entities open to the public to require proof of vaccination or negative test for entrance. To be cautious with your activities to avoid illness and injury in the coming weeks as healthcare access delays are being reported and these delays are expected to continue for the foreseeable future. To consider how you can limit your activities to prevent exposure to COVID-19. And number six, of course, spend time outdoors enjoying our beautiful city. Uh, I've had a, a number of emails and, and conversations with people uh, asking why this isn't a flat out a mask mandate, why we aren't mandating uh, masks in, in the city of Bloomington. And two primary reasons as far as I'm concerned, and then I'll open up to conversation. would like to hear the, the, the feedback from the council on this. I think uh, the, the first reason is uh, we have been following for the past two years, very specifically we've been following the guidelines and the recommendations of the Centers for Disease Control and for the, of the Minnesota Department of Health. Basically the whereas that I just read, or excuse me, the now therefore that I just read is basically the recommendations from the Minnesota Department of Health and from the Centers of Disease Control about ways that we can manage this. There, are, there, there is not a specific mask mandate recommendation by those two organizations and I believe for consistency's sake that it makes sense that we continue to follow their guidelines. If they would move forward with a mask mandate, I would be much more comfortable encouraging it in the city of Bloomington. But as it stands now with the recommendations that they have, uh, I think we're much more appropriate following the recommendations that they have laid out. The second uh, argument I think against a mask mandate is the difficulty around uh, enforcement of a mask mandate. It, um, we, we know that there are some people who simply will not wear a mask and it will and it will and it has in the past become an issue. And I am just very hesitant to, to issue a mask mandate and regardless of what happens in, in private business settings, just thinking about what we can control here at uh, in Bloomington with our Bloomington facilities, I do not want uh, City Hall staff to become the mask police for folks who show up without a mask on. I don't want to have to uh, worry about our, uh, our, our staff at the Bloomington Ice Garden to have to mandate and enforce a mask mandate because again, there will be people who, who say flat out no and then it will become a, a flashpoint and then it's a matter of where we stand and go, for, go to from there. So I'm, I'm supportive of the way this is written. Uh, it, it strongly encourages folks to, to comply with these requirements, with these suggestions of the Department of Health and with the CDC. If we uh, would all do this, if it would move forward, I think we would be in a much better place over the next six weeks than we may be otherwise. And I think uh, one of the keys in, in the resolution is uh, the, finally, the, the final resolve uh, where it reads, be it finally resolved that the city, its residents, and its businesses will get through this together. And if we are kind and patient with each other during this COVID-19 pandemic, then we will be a stronger and even better city after this global health pandemic. So it would be my recommendation that we move forward with this resolution. Uh, I'm confident that uh, council has thoughts or would like to discuss this a little bit further. So I'd like to throw it open to the council for discussion on this one. Council? I see Council Member Nelson and then Council Member Coulter. Council Member Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. A couple quick questions. Um, sorry, my dog's unhappy with me right now. Um, the uh, 
first question that comes to mind is in addition to encouraging, are there active steps that the city can or should consider in order to encourage or to motivate uh, individuals and businesses uh, short of a mandate? Are there other things we can do? I believe the city of Edina worked to put some money towards uh, of providing access to masks and things like that. One of the ideas I had for um, uh, some of our uh, uh, um, restaurants and things was, you know, would it be possible to waive liquor license fees or something like that if they were to require uh, vaccination and or negative test or something along those lines? I'm just kind of spitballing ideas here, but is there more that we can do in terms of encouragement? Dr. Kelly and Mr. Verbrugge, do you know of any uh, carrots that are being offered by municipalities that we might consider here in Bloomington? Um, I'll go first, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Nelson. Uh, we have not uh, proposed rolling out any of those types of in, um, in inducements or incentives. Uh, we can certainly do some research to the suggestions that you have that were different than what I've seen in other cities, like what Adina is doing. The idea about um, the uh, uh, liquor licenses or forgiveness in other areas, uh, we could have legal staff do some research on that. Um, I, you know, part of the part of the concern I have at this point is uh, almost um, what I would refer to as maybe regulation fatigue, uh, and so. I think that uh, Council Member Nelson, your your suggestion of trying to put um, a more positive approach on this is uh, certainly something that's worth looking into. So we'll do a little we'll do a little research on staff to that question and follow up with the council. I don't know, Dr. Kelly, if you have any additional thoughts, uh, if you're seeing what other public health agencies are doing. Council Member Nelson, we. We do have language on our website now uh, to support uh, if businesses chose to do that, uh, things they could print or, or use on that end. I don't know, uh, Blair, did you have any other insight that you've seen from other places? I don't, I think, um, you know, what we hear is just the importance of communication and messaging that's really tailored to the local community. Um, and so connecting with community leaders to make sure that the messaging is on point and relevant. Um, similar to regulation fatigue, I think there's just messaging fatigue right now too. So that's the only other thing that I would add. Thank you, Council Member Nelson. Yeah. Thank you, uh, all of you, I appreciate it. Um, and then just kind of quick follow up there. Uh, is what type of communication would there be to uh, businesses and individuals in order to encourage them to comply? Mr. Verbrugge, do we have a uh, communications plan around this uh, resolution? Uh, Mr. Mayor, we haven't convened with our communications staff about the external communications to get word out on this. Uh, we can, we'll certainly do that this week and make sure that there is uh, broad awareness in the community for the council's action. And I think to uh, Council Member Nelson's point, broad awareness, certainly, but then also uh, guidance in where, where necessary in terms of uh, requiring masks or, or even if vaccination cards, that type of thing for individual businesses, how to work through that or how to, to message that to their, to their patrons and customers. It, Mayor, I apologize if, if I might jump in with just Please. one more thing. Um, just, you know, one of the things that I think would be interesting is to provide retailers, uh, hotels, restaurants with information on what the impacts of requiring uh, either uh, masks, vaccines, or negative tests in their venues as appropriate might be, because I think there's a lot of fear uh, from the business side of implementing those types of practices because they're afraid of getting the backlash. And so if people are interested in doing something more significant, it's a little easier for the city because people are going to be mad at us no matter what we do. So, um, you know, you know, but they they take they're the front lines of those complaints and things like that. And, you know, 
if we have information we can provide that says, hey, you know what, yeah, you might get a few complaints, but you're also going to get a lot of people that respond very positively to you creating a safe environment for them to shop or relax or uh, entertain in, um, and, and it, give them that information. It might encourage some of them to do more than they would have otherwise. Thank you, Councilmember Nelson. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is probably a question for uh, the city attorney, but um, obviously, as we all know, the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul have issued mask mandates. And I'm wondering if the city attorney could detail a little bit how those cities uh, plan to enforce those particular mandates. What what structure do they have in place? What I mean, essentially, what is what is sort of the outcome of, of actually issuing those mandates? Ms. Manderford? Uh, Mayor, members, I can't specifically speak to the enforcement plans for uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul, but I will say one of the distinct differences is that I believe that those two jurisdictions continue to have a local emergency in place, which is distinct from the city of Bloomington. Thank you. That Yeah, that I did not realize that. I actually had thought their local emergencies had expired, so that's um, that's critical to know. But um, I have a few thoughts to share, but maybe I'll, I'll step out of the way and if other folks have questions, we can do that first. Council, any additional questions? Seeing no questions, Council Member Coulter, if you do have thoughts to share, I think it will be appropriate for you to do so. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, I guess, you know, just to sort of echo what, what I think a lot of folks are feeling and, and what Dr. Kelly frankly said, I'm really frustrated and really disappointed that we are where we are. This this is just so much harder than than it should be. And that's that's just really, really frustrating to me. And you know the 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 truth is that I wanted to support a mask mandate. I really did because I, I feel like we should be doing something, right? And you know the just the reality is when I thought about it, you know I I am just not convinced that issuing a mask mandate, particularly when we may not even really have much of a much authority to enforce it in any kind of real way, it nobody who isn't already wearing a mask is going to do so because the city of Bloomington tells them to do so, particularly if we can't enforce it in any real way and. Absent declaring another local emergency, which my understanding our, our original one was sort of predicated on the governor having declared a statewide emergency and absent that I don't know that we could. Um, but even I'm frankly, even with that enforcement would be challenging at best and and I, I think it would be really not much of an effort at all. And if we can't enforce it, we can declare whatever we want, but it ultimately would be meaningless. And, you know, the the truth is, I, you know, I heard the governor recently say that that he doesn't feel the need that to issue a statewide mask mandate, that he feels localities uh, should do this on their own. And, and to be quite frank, I just disagree with that assessment. I think what we are seeing now is is more than a statewide crisis. It is a national crisis. And and I think if, if that's the step that needs to be taken, then it does need to be taken, frankly, at a state level. Um, but I just I don't know that doing it at the local level, particularly again, where our enforcement would be really pretty minimal. Um, I, I'm just not a fan of declaring something for its own sake. Um, I, you know, I support this resolution and I, I think Councilmember Nelson had a really fantastic idea. If there are other things that we can do to incentivize private businesses and other folks to to do those things. Yes, let's do it. Let's think creatively about about what we can do. Um, but I, you know, the, the issuing a mandate to me is is sort of putting lipstick on a pig and not really any kind of effective measure. So I do support the resolution and uh, I'm happy to move forward with it. Maybe not happy, but eager to move forward. With it. Understood. Council, any additional thoughts, comments? Councilmember Lohman. Mayor, if there are no other comments, uh, I'd be uh, happy uh, 
uh, move this forward. I think that both what you've stated and other council members have stated is pretty succinct and on point. Uh, but I certainly want to give other folks a chance if they want to say something. Folks, anybody else want to chime in? Councilmember Loman, I'd look for action on this. Mayor, I'll move to approve the resolution uh, encouraging Bloomington to follow the COVID-19 safety guidelines as the mayor has outlined uh, earlier. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Loman and a second by Councilmember Carter to adopt an ordinance as attached to the staff report amending city code to create a definition for temporary pandemic or emergency service. F f excuse me, excuse me, wrong one. I'm missing. Uh, doubling back to approve the resolution encouraging Bloomington to follow COVID-19 safety guidance. It's been a long day, I apologize. <laughs> it started early. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Hearing no further council discussion, Mr. Brillert. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. So uh, I do think, uh, Mr. Verbrugge, if, if staff could take a cursory look at some possible incentives that we could uh, offer to businesses to, uh, along the lines of Councilmember Nelson's line of questioning, I think that makes good sense. Uh, maybe come back and, and bring those back in the next couple of weeks and see if there's anything else that not only would be feasible, but uh, if there are other examples in cities where it seems to be working. So if we could do that, that would be greatly appreciated. We will do that. Thank, Thank you, you. Council members. Dr. Kelly and Ms. Harrison, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you for your expertise, as always, on this. And thank you for your wise guidance and counsel. Uh, we do appreciate it. And I, too, Dr. Kelly, I look forward to the time when you can come before us to talk about another topic rather than just a, a pandemic on a worldwide basis. So thank you. Thanks much. We'll move to item six on our agenda, which is our consent business. And Councilmember Carter, you have our consent agenda tonight. I do. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I have ho I've heard about holds for six eight and six nine. Are there any other holds? Okay, I'm not seeing any. So I would move to approve items six point one through six point seven. Second. Got a motion by Councilmember Carter, a second by Councilmember Coulter to approve our consent business as stated. There are no further council discussion on this. Mr. Brillert. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Loman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. We will move on to item seven, our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances. And tonight we have one public hearing. Uh, Mayor, we have those two Mayor. consent items. <laughs> Thank you. I apologize for that. Look at me. Um, wow. Thanks much. Please. <laughs> no worries, Mayor. Um, so I'm actually not sure who held 6 8 and 6 9. So 6 8 is Councilmember so Delfano. I think there was an administrative thing, and then I have. Okay. So. Um, Mayor and council members, I can go first. So 6.8 was just held. Uh, there was a resolution added. No changes to the item. There just wasn't a resolution initially attached uh, to the item. 6.9, there's a typo on one of the, the minutes items, and I can go into further detail when, when ready on that. All right, 6.8 was held. Uh, yeah, so yes. that was me, Mr. Council Mayor. Yeah, so um, the reason I decided to hold this is nothing wrong with what was there or anything. I don't have any questions about the specific add uh, to the um, additional um, employees. But um, there's been a number of, of public comments uh, recently about uh, the salaries of the individuals uh, that we're that we are hiring, especially as we post job descriptions and things like that. And um, I noticed in the in the um, uh, packet that that the entire list of of, of job uh, descriptions and and salaries are posted, and so I thought it would be a good time, uh, I, maybe for a point of personal privilege to educate me, but also to um, to, to describe a little bit more specifically how we determine our salary ranges for the jobs that we uh, the job 
classifications that we have, uh, how it compares to other cities, and how often it is reviewed and by whom. So we just get out there in the public discourse, um, you know, that we do have checks and balances if we do, et cetera, that kind of thing. So I don't know, uh, Mr. Uh, Verbrugge, if you want to take that, but I'd love to just have you respond. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, I appreciate that. Um, so the the way that we put together our compensation plan is uh, is fairly complicated. So I'm going to try to um, boil this down to some, um, just a few points to, to try and explain it. First of all, um, the compensation system for local governments in Minnesota is heavily influenced by a couple of requirements uh, that that we have to follow. One of them is the pay equity law. Uh, and another one is uh, the, the process for uh, granting veterans preference. So with the, with the veterans preference, what that means is that um, we, it's, more of, it's more in the recruitment process, but we have to uh, score uh, applicants. Um, and in order to do uh, the scoring of applicants uh, and to do it fairly, uh, we have to have job descriptions and, that are tied to the nature of the work, and then the, the process with the screening is tied to those job descriptions. So each of our job descriptions, you're correct, Councilmember D'Alessandro, um, each, each of the jobs in our compensation plan have a detailed um, job description. Our compensation plan um, puts those jobs into different um, strata based on some calculations about and some considerations for things like span of control, level of education that's necessary, um, the, the impact and influence of decision making and also the consequence of um, mistakes in the, in, in the conduct of the job. Uh, and so the, you know, the higher the the influence or the impact or the consequence, the, the more points that they get in our system. And then uh, the, when I mentioned pay equity, uh, we have to make sure that all of our jobs and job classes are uh, administered fairly, that we don't, we don't have inequities uh, for male dominated classes, and female dominated classes. Uh, so it's, a, it's a rigorous system that has to be administered. Um, hopefully you're not losing me. I'm seeing my triangles of death popping up on the screen. So somebody just nod your head if uh, you can still hear me right now. Okay, I got a thumbs up. All right. Uh, so to your question, Council Member D'Alessandro, about how often we update it. Well, first of all, our compensation plan is approved annually by the City Council. The last time that we went out and did a study of our compensation um, plan and all of our job descriptions, was in 2018-2019. Uh, what we do when we do a study like that is we look at the, uh, the market, so making sure that the City of Bloomington compensation uh, system is consistent with and competitive with other local government jurisdictions. Um, so we have to make sure as a recruitment and retention strategy that we are paying our employees fairly uh, so in, in that compensation plan analysis, uh, if residents are concerned about how we uh, compensate our employees, uh, I can assure you that we are very um, consistent with other municipalities uh, and competitive, especially organizations that are of the size and complexity of the city of Bloomington. Um, and when we, when we do that compensation plan, we also have to look at uh, internal um, relationships for all of those positions, because as the council is aware, we have many different lines of business. And so it is complicated to figure out uh, how a police officer is uh, scored and compensated compared to a city planner, uh, compared to uh, somebody who works in public health or somebody who is a maintenance worker in public works, because we have so many different um, jobs and, and classifications uh, it's a it's a complicated system of uh, making sure that um, w w you know we're we're properly uh, considering all of those different job issues. So uh, I think that's a long way of saying it's a complicated system. 
we uh, we studied it most recently, 2018, 2019. We validated our compensation uh, against the other um, comparable communities to make sure that we were not out of line, and we were not. Uh, and we have the council review it at least annually, and then you see like tonight you have an amendment to it whenever there are new positions. I should also point out that we do have um, uh, it, the merit board, uh, which uh, is required to uh, review uh, certain aspects of our um, personnel policies. Uh, and we run many of our uh, uh, considerations through the merit board before they come to the city council as well. Mr. Mayor, just one follow up real quick. Thank you. Um, so I, is there a third party involved in that uh, in that regular um, I don't know, is it is it every couple of years then that we do that? And is it done by us or a third party? Uh, good question, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro. Uh, we had actually not done a compensation study in a number of years. So when we did it uh, three years ago, it, it was the first update in quite a while. And we we did hire a consultant to work through that process. Um, the, uh, the amount of uh, data that needs to be gathered and the expertise to analyze that data from all of the different uh, agencies and entities that, that we use as comparisons um, is beyond the capacity of our staff to do. So uh, we, when we do a full compensation study like that, uh, we, uh, we bring in an outside entity to assist us in that. Council, any additional questions on this? Seeing none, I would look for a motion. Thank you, appreciate it. Do you mean you need to do that? Please. Okay, sure. Um, okay, so uh, item 6.8, uh, I'll make a motion to adopt a resolution to approve the attached 2022 compensation plan for full-time non-union employees of the city of Bloomington as amended. Second. Second. We have a motion by Council Member D'Alessandro, a second by Council Member Carter to adopt the resolution as outlined in item 6.8 in our consent business. Hearing no further council discussion, Mr. Brillard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Item 6.9. Mr. Brillard. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so on item 6.9, a uh, resident contacted me to alert, uh, alert me to a typo on the minutes for December 6th. Uh, that is found on page 63 of the packet under item 8.2 of those December 6th minutes. It should read uh, on December 13th. Uh, there was going to be a special meeting not on December 6th, which is the date of that same meeting. Uh, that will be corrected in the revised minutes. Thank you, Mr. Brillard. Council, any questions on that change, the technical change within the minutes? Council Member Carter. So I would move to approve the minutes of the November 15th, November 22nd, November 29th, December 6th, and December 20th meetings with the noted correction for the December 6th minutes. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion by Council Member Carter, second by Council Member, is that Martin? I missed, Council Member Martin, uh, to approve the minutes of November 15th, November 22nd, the 29th, December 6th, and December 20th, with the correction as noted. Hearing no further council discussion on this, Mr. Brillard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bosey. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. I'm going to pause and collect my thoughts and make sure that we are indeed now on to item 7. And I'm good we are. Uh, item 7, our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances tonight. And our only public hearing tonight is item 7.1, which is a privately initiated city code amendment. It's for a temporary pandemic or emergency service facilities as an interim use. And Mr. Mike Centenario from our planning department is here to lead us through this. Good evening, Thanks, Mr. Centenario. Mayor. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, the next item on your agenda uh, is indeed the privately initiated city code amendment. 
And uh, when we, what we mean by privately initiated is that a uh, private party uh, paid the fee and submitted the application applied to uh, change the city code. It wasn't a staff initiated change. And what we're here to discuss is uh, temporary pandemic and emergency service facilities. Uh, it, it, it is more discussion on the pandemic. Uh, I think we got some bad news early in the meeting, um, uh, but that does play into the, the discussion for uh, the ordinance change. And uh, the council is well aware of all these, uh, um, what we've been uh, dealing with for the, almost two years now. Uh, but there was an emergency declaration in March of 2020 uh, and from a land use context uh, that did allow a lot of discretion and flexibility from our typical uh, land use processes and procedures, it just to be uh, much, much broader than that, but in a zoning land use context uh, that did end. And uh, we're learning and well aware of the need for uh, COVID-19 testing facilities uh, to remain a variety of different types of facilities, uh, whether that's at home tests or uh, your local clinic, uh, but then also uh, privately run uh, testing facilities like, um, uh, like we'll discuss in a moment. But there is no allowance currently in city code to allow these types of uh, temporary facilities. And so uh, one entity that's operating one of these sites, GS Labs, uh, is the applicant uh, to amend the city code to allow it on an interim basis. And so, uh, as I mentioned, at GS Labs, they, they operate a testing site uh, at the Mall of America or the, the pork chop site, as we like to call it. Uh, perhaps some uh, members of the council or your family have, have gotten a test uh, at this facility. Uh, but the original uh, application was for a very narrowly tailored amendment uh, to their type of site at the Mall of America. Uh, so it would not apply really anywhere else in the city uh, and they agreed to allow staff to broaden that amendment uh, to essentially create a, a set of standards for uh, what we're calling or requesting to call temporary pandemic and emergency service facilities. And this would apply for the entire city. And so we would add this type of use uh, as an interim on an interim basis uh, throughout the city. And this, again, this is the site that you're probably familiar with uh, and the, the the north end of the Mall of America campus on American Boulevard and 24th Avenue. That's really the impetus for this application, uh, but we do have uh, or have had inquiries uh, for other entities to establish these sites. And currently we, we don't have a mechanism uh, to allow them on in, in more of a temporary uh, type setting. So this, the proposed definition is pretty straightforward uh, and is deliberately uh, pretty broad. Uh, but that is a, a temporary facility that provides uh, non-residential services, <clears throat> excuse me, in response to a pandemic or emergency. Uh, we did get some feedback from uh, council members on, on maybe that there should be some more inclusion in the word uh, epidemic. So a, a temporary pandemic slash epidemic or emergency service facility, uh, just to be even broader. Uh, and we thought that was, that was really good feedback. Uh, so we'll look to the council to, to talk about that and, and uh, direct staff if they want to include that type of uh, that word and slightly change the definition. If we were to include uh, uh, or change pandemic to pandemic slash epidemic, it'd be a very, very easy thing to do uh, in the ordinance. Uh, I did have a conversation with the applicant uh, uh, with GS Labs and they, they verbally accepted that change. It wouldn't really impact uh, their application or what their, what their needs are. There we go. And so in terms of the uh, what this would look like uh, in the city code, we have use tables that identify a variety of uses and then the zoning district that they apply to. And uh, this this use uh, would be added throughout the zoning code uh, and, and you can see an I, which means an interim use. So there would be an additional step where an applicant would have to appear before the planning commission, there would be a public hearing uh, and uh, request an interim use permit which can be is approved for up to five years. Again, this is another example of, of what the use tables look like in city code. And, and we are proposing some pretty general performance standards. Uh, we think a lot of this is common sense, but it should be spelled out in city code. So 
uh, as we have conversations with applicants and, and we're reviewing interim use permits, uh, we have something to, to uh, base our uh, analysis on. And that includes deliveries, uh, certainly trash, whether that's a biohazard or just your run of the mill trash. Uh, for drive through facilities, we want to ensure that there is sufficient stacking as we're not creating a congestion problem or a, a safety hazard, especially uh, we want to avoid having uh, stacking or queuing in public right of way. Uh, these types of facilities, depending on what sort of emergency might occur in the future, uh, presumably these, these facilities might operate 24 hours a day. And so at night, there needs to be adequate light, uh, lighting on site. Um, whether they're tents or trailers, uh, these are temporary in nature. Uh, so we want to ensure that it's clear that these are permitted. And, uh, you know, while we think commercial uh, sites might be a good spot, especially the Mall of America, which is an over, uh, overflow, overflow parking lot, uh, there could be a variety of sites where these uh, would be uh, be located. Uh, so, but we want to ensure that these are uh, at least occupied by a non-residential use. And then lastly, uh, we are proposing the Planning Commission to be the approval authority, um, but we think that inherently there has to be flexibility uh, in establishing these types of temporary facilities. Um, a lot of our code requirements relate to permanent, uh, permanent buildings, of like physical permanent buildings. And that's, re that's really not, uh, wouldn't be an option for these types of uh, emergency facilities. So with interim use permits, we do have a, a variety of findings of fact in city code. Uh, I can certainly go through these uh, if you'd like, uh, but essentially, when we review interim use permits, we're looking at the performance standards uh, that uh, if they do exist in city code, but then also the findings uh, for interim use permits. And that combination allows us to really uh, uh, assist applicants and uh, help them through the process and ensure that uh, we're meeting a, a need in the community, but then also we're trying to avoid any sort of uh, nu nuisance characteristics or, or conflicts within the community. With that, we are we are recommending approval. Uh, I do have a motion before you. Um, again, we did get some feedback from a council member, and uh, if you'd like to amend uh, the definition and the city code to incorporate epidemic, uh, we can certainly uh, uh, consider that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Centenario. Council questions on this, or recommendations, perhaps for update uh, to add. Couple of words here and there, if, if need be. Councilmember D'Alessandro. I do have a couple of questions, but yes, I was the one that kind of asked the question about um, about the expansion of the language, just simply because you know, for a period of time, uh, this was considered an epidemic in a, a particular country, right? And we could be the initiator of an epidemic at some point that becomes a pandemic. But you know, maybe we set these things up. So if we can, I'd I'd love to see us add that um it sounds like uh doing something like you know public health emergency was a little too broad and maybe wouldn't wouldn't be supported and that makes sense so um that would be great but here's my question I, I um you mentioned in the findings of fact um that they have to have certainty to an end date uh but that seems like how do they extend it then when for example we might have already ended the applicants uh, end date a couple of times now, uh, but we would want to make sure they can continue to operate. So can you tell me how that works? And then uh, secondly, um, how does this actually happen quickly if we're in an emergency? Like what's the process? Because obviously our, our normal processes for permitting take a bit of time and, and go back and forth a number of times. So I was curious if there was any kind of fast tracking or anything that you'd do in this particular case. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Centenario. Uh, Councilmember D'Alessandro, uh, uh, to your first question, the process in which to extend an interim use permit is to simply apply for an interim use permit extension. So an interim use permit does have uh, uh, an expiration uh, that is established through uh, the, the entitlement. Uh, it can be up to five years, but we have had interim use permits that last two, three, even four years. And uh, the intent of an interim use permit is to ensure you're allowing a use uh, that may not uh, be appropriate permanently or may not meet every uh, uh, permanent development standard, uh, but it is not the intent to have it uh, uh, exist for 50, 60 plus years. Uh, however, we do have some uses that uh, at the end of their interim use permit, the, the characteristics of the development or the marketplace uh, really hasn't, um, doesn't support permanent development. 
uh, at that time where there really aren't any development plans at play uh, to essentially replace an interim use, uh, we would consider uh, uh, a reapproval as part of an interim use permit extension application. For the, for the timeline and review, you know, we, when we have uh, zoning applications, we have notice requirements as well as the requirement to uh, publish the application in the newspaper. We send out notices to neighbors. There really isn't a fast tracking, uh, established fast tracking process uh, for zoning applications. Uh, it, is, it is set uh, in city code and by state law. Uh, however, in an emergency situation, uh, for example, if uh, emergency declaration um, is established and as, as it was in the state of Minnesota, uh, within that declaration, there presumably would be some additional flexibility uh, for cities to operate how they need to operate in a, in a here and now uh, scenario. Uh, so, and that's, and that's how the testing facilities have been in operation uh, until now. So we're trying to essentially kind of backfill, um, you know, a, a, a need uh, now that the emergency de declaration has ended. That helpful, Councilmember? It totally does. Thank you for your help. Appreciate Thank you. It. Council, additional questions? Councilmember Lowman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so, uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, this sounds like a good idea and uh, to move forward with it, uh, you know, if it makes sense. Uh, but some of the questions I had in terms of how this operates and works, maybe not necessarily with this particular uh, emergency that we have and how it might be uh, uh, Placed, but I'm wondering about in terms of, of if you have traffic issues, probably not going to have traffic issues with this site uh, that happen uh, because, you know, you need to get to that. And, you know, this is one of the, the main uh, locations. How is that handled, uh, you know, in this circumstance? And then other ones uh, that I, I kind of come up with, because certainly this is not the only place where this, you know, this could be, um, this could happen if we, we implement this. But, you know, if you have... Uh, uh, residential areas or places that are close by that are impacted by smells that may emanate uh, uh, from uh, the site. How are these and other types of issues handled once you have approval and then, oh, no, now, now we've got a problem with storage. You know, now we've got folks who are storing things not where we intended. How do we handle uh, or how is that handled from a complaint standpoint and from those residents or uh, businesses? that are around that area who had a certain understanding of what it might look like, and now it's, it's somehow uh, uh, different. Mr. Centenario. Sure, Mr. Mayor, Council Member, I, I think the concern uh, really points to the need to have uh, an approval on record and a public process to, uh, to go through where folks have an opportunity to review what's being proposed, uh, provide comments, talk to staff, uh, present or provide their feedback to the planning commission in a public hearing setting. Uh, so, and that's one of the reasons why we, we have these entitlement processes to make sure that things are public and folks are aware of what's being proposed in their neighborhood. Uh, but, you know, going to the concerns about the operations, uh, you know, as part of our, uh, development review process, we have a team we, you know, the staff really works as a team, uh, and I'm a city planner, but I'm not an expert in traffic by any means. However, we do have staff in the city that, that are, and they would be uh, a part of this review process uh, once we have an application. And even before we have an application, uh, we provide feedback and review things uh, to, to see if it's an appropriate use. So really, it's a team effort from different staff that have different uh, uh, pr professions and, and uh, expertise. Um, but <clears throat> things don't necessarily work out as intended, uh, even if, or things aren't, uh, operated in accordance to the plans that someone might submit and have approved. Uh, so if there are <clears throat> nuisance characteristics, we do have uh, an environmental health division that does have the ability to, to make uh, to take enforcement action. Uh, if there is something to be found that's in violation of city code, or if there's uh, general nuisance characteristics uh, that we feel need, need to be mitigated. Uh, so that in that, in that instance, uh, our enforcement staff would take action. Okay. Well, just because I, I want to be clear about this, you know, I just want to be sure because now we're, we're putting this thing together, we're, we're drafting it. I know on some occasions we've had problems where we weren't able to enforce things. And so I just want to be sure that we're able to, you know, to enforce it. So let's just take the example where we have uh, smells emanating out of uh, a location like this. 
walk me through that process in terms by which that we would uh, uh, resolve that that issue and how, what 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 tools do we have to, to be able to mitigate something like that? For example, sure, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Member, <laughs> you point out one of the, one of the very difficult uh, areas to enforce is odor. Uh, there is no odor meter. Um, you can't measure it. Uh, it and what might be odorous to one person is pleasant to another person. So it is very difficult. Uh, uh, but what we would do is, well, first off, we we try to uh, avoid the situation to begin with. You know, if there's if there was a use that we felt uh, was going to create a nuisance characteristic, we would hopefully point them into a different site that might not be uh, injurious or have an impact to the neighborhood. Uh, if if that if that there is in fact a, a nuisance. Uh, we do have uh, city code requirements um, and uh, some of it is uh, more qualitative judgment based, uh, but that's why we have professional staff to make those judgments and to take action. So in terms of the steps, uh, first off, there would, uh, our enforcement staff would investigate the issue if they're presuming there's a complaint. And if they feel the, there is a violation, uh, we issue a, a, a enforcement order uh, to correct the issue. And that's given a timeline. Uh, so the property owner or the applicant or the operator would have an opportunity to correct the issue before the city, uh, you know, for example, issue citations um, or shuts down a facility uh, using its police powers. <clears throat> we would have the ability if such thing event took place, uh, even after um, approving it and we find out, oh, it's a little bit different, we could then come back. This council could remove that over time after that process is followed we'd be able to remove that, uh, uh, that that permitted use in that particular location. That's what I'm hearing you say. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, uh, council member, you know, again, going back to the need to have a public transparent process in order to rescind an interim use permit, just like in order to rescind a conditional use permit, uh, we have to go through steps to do that. But but yes, uh, if, if the interim use permit is being operated uh, inconsistently with the approval, uh, the city has recourse. And I am supportive of uh, of uh, council members uh, change around the uh, epidemic uh, language. I think that makes good sense. Um, that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Loman. Uh, along the same lines, Mr. Centenario, just looking at the standards, uh, considering what this what this is and what we could envision, what would be going on, it would it be appropriate to put within the standards anything along the lines of uh, a security of any kind, or is that more in the staff review, much like a parking plan or a, or a traffic plan, would it fall? more under the auspices of uh, a staff review rather than in standards. Sure, uh, Mr. Mayor. You know, the uh, I think it, it would be within uh, city staff's uh, discretion. And, you know, when we do our analysis to recommend uh, certain things that, uh, you know, the interim use permit or a conditional use permit, uh, there is varied levels of discretion. Uh, and while we do have performance standards that would be established, that doesn't mean that there's nothing else that we could, uh, we think would be appropriate uh, for a particular type of use. It's really difficult when we're, we're deliberately trying to be general uh, in our uh, definition and our performance standards because what we're trying to do is plan for a future emergency, let alone try to address one that exists right now. Um, so there might be there might be certain things that we're not thinking of, uh, but uh, staff does have the ability to, re to review uh, certain um applications, and we do have the ability to uh, recommend conditions of approval uh, that might go above and beyond the performance standards if it's if it's in line with uh, the, the findings. That makes sense. Thank you. I appreciate that. Council, anything additional? Any additional questions of staff? Mr. Centenario, are there... Uh, applicants here uh, that wish to speak or are they just here to answer questions, you know, offhand? Uh, Mr. Mayor, the applicant was on the phone. I, I think she, her intent was to listen in. Okay. Uh, I was able to speak with her earlier. I'm still here. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. well, Hi. Ms. Johnson, perhaps you could uh, just confirm uh, that you're comfortable with that, that minor change to include uh, epidemic in addition to pandemic. Yes, we are. Confirmed. Very good. And for the record, this is Jody Johnson, who is uh, the applicant on this? On this? Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, yeah. Very the good. GFI. I see Ms. Manderscheid with her hand up. Ms. Manderscheid? 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, in consultation with um, uh, the planning manager, Glenn Markegaard, um, earlier today, um, wondering if specifically the, the edit could be um, edited. Thanks, Member Mayor, totally fine. Okay with that? Okay. All right, I think we are good with that. Thanks for that clarification. Any additional questions? If not, this is a public hearing, so now I would like to open the public hearing on item 7.1, which is a privately initiated city code amendment, temporary pandemic, comma, epidemic, comma, or emergency services facilities as an in interim use. Anyone wishing to speak to item 7.1 tonight? Please. Good evening. If you could identify yourself. Good evening. My name is Brian Savig. Um, I wasn't planning to speak on this topic, um, but um, wondering first that that may answer and several other questions I have. This, I realize this current one is probably a, a profit-oriented one, but would this also apply to uh, nonprofits or city-funded items, services that? That is a good question. Uh, Ms. Mandershide or Mr. Verbrugge, is this uh, only for a for-profit or would it also include to uh, public or non-profit applications? Mr. Mayor and Council Members, I see the City Attorney is scanning right now. You know, the uh, planning staff might be able to speak to this better, but I, I don't think it is um, looking at the non-profit or the for-profit status of the um, business user, this is a, a land use entitlement. And so I think it is whatever operation of this kind was in this certain location would be able to operate. And I'll look at Mr. Centenario and see if I'm correct there. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. City Manager, that, that's correct. The This is very much a land use uh, uh, change uh, to the city code. It's silent on whether an applicant or entity is for-profit or non-for-profit. We, the GS Labs is a for-profit entity, but uh, we very well could see an interim use permit application through a nonprofit. Uh, and what about a, a city-funded operation or partially subsidized? Uh, again, I think what I heard staff say, it, it didn't, who is running it, I think, doesn't necessarily matter. It's just what is happening on the, on the land. So it's a land use issue as opposed to an operational issue. Right, but um, if it's city-funded, then I have some other concerns like, length of term and so forth, that things tend to get started but not stopped. Well, I think there is uh, a, there is a, a length of term requirement in the, in uh, uh, the, the standards here. Is there not, uh, Mr. Centenario? Mr. Mayor, yes, there is. The, 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 the interim use permit uh, has a five-year maximum time period. Now, the entity, uh, if it's the city or if it's a nonprofit or for-profit would have to apply to extend that. Uh, so they would not be permitted to extend beyond a, a five year uh, period if that was the approved time period. Right, I, my concern is, is more if it's city funded, five years is a long time for an emergency. Obviously it's difficult to define your emergencies in advance and there's trade-offs like if there's a significant capital investment in in enhancing that facility to be able to serve its function, obviously they're not going to be happy with a, a one-year permit or something like that. But if it's city-funded, then, you know, again, five years is a long time to run if, let's say, the, the emergency is a two-year, but there's nothing to automatically shut it down. So I, I guess I would urge the consideration that if it's city-funded, they have to periodically reapply sooner than five years. I'm thinking maybe annually or biannually, something like that, so that there is a decision made to continue to fund this or not and not just leave it open for five years. I appreciate your concern, um, Mr. Savick. I appreciate your concern regarding the five years, but then again, 
two years ago, I don't know that anyone would have thought we'd be in the middle of a two-year pandemic with well, no end in sight as we as we move forward. Right, but I, I think what we typically do with with our permits, uh, anything along these li lines, uh, what what is expected of one is expected of all. So if if it's in private, if it's a nonprofit, if it's a city, generally the rules are followed. And right, but one is a spending issue for the city; the other is just allowing something. Granted, it's a spending issue by the city, but um, I, I don't know that I agree with your uh, assumption that once it starts, it doesn't stop. Just because it's a city spending issue, I think it's a, it's a matter of whether or not it would be necessary in that time and up for the five years. Okay. Uh, the other thing I would suggest for consideration is the notification. Um, publishing a newspaper is great, but if it's in a residential area, I don't know if that's going to be seen and you know I realize there's a business uh, journal and even when I was in business you know it was a bit much to have to read that every week to see if something was going to impact you in a significant way I'd suggest if it's a residential area that some mailing in a targeted number of blocks away from this would go out that would also help fast track it in the situations we need to um, Thank you. And uh, then finally, the uh, the parking and, the, and and part of the reason for suggesting that is uh, near my neighborhood, unknowns to us, um, an operation was set up for some kind of out, outpatient care or something like that, where there's a three lane double stall driveway. That's always full, and the street's full, and it's a fairly narrow street. We had no idea it was going in. The house was sold, and suddenly it's being used like that. So, again, that's a situation like that, that a mailing would have been helpful. Possibly this was noticed in a paper, but, you know, we never saw anything. So, anyway, finally, uh, uh, I guess that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for Thank you. consideration. Mr. Sable, do we have anyone on the phone who wishes to speak to item 7.1? Uh, no, Mr. Mayor, uh, no speakers on the phone. I'll make a last call for anyone to speak in the chambers. And seeing no one coming forward, Council, I would look for a motion to close tonight's public hearing on item 7.1. So moved. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Council Member D'Alessandro, a second by Council Member Martin to close the public hearing on tonight's uh, item 7.1. Hearing no further uh, Council discussion on this, Mr. Brillard. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. D'Alessandro? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Public hearing is closed on item 7.1. Council, any additional concerns, any additional questions? Council Member Nelson and then Council Member Lohman. Council Member Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just a quick couple follow-ups on our uh, public commenter there, Brian. Um, so if there was spending involved from the city, I assume that would be a budget thing that we had to do every year so that even though there may have been a use permit, interim use permit for five years, uh, we would have review of any budgetary spending if that was the case, at least annually. Is that accurate? I believe that's an accurate statement, Councilmember Nelson. Okay. And then if there was a use set up and you know, the emergency lasted six months, and this is more of a general theoretical concept, but would there be a reason to continue the use even if they had a five-year permit if there was no reason to do it, if the emergency was over? Like if there was a, a reason to set up a place because of, you know, uh, heaven forbid, a, a tornado or something of that nature, you know, once that was done, I, there would seem to be no reason for that organization to still be there. Uh, am I thinking about that correctly? Like it's, it, the, the five years is just a maximum, but if they don't need to be there, they would discontinue their operations. 
I, I believe that is correct, Councilmember Nelson. Uh, Mr. Centenario, I think uh, you had mentioned a sunset date or, or an expected date. Yes, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember, the yeah, up to five years is a is the maximum allowance uh, under this zoning entitlement. But uh, Councilmember Nelson, to your point, if if an emergency ends and there's there's no need or desire to continue operation of this type of facility, uh, there's no reason why it can't cease early. Um, okay. No one is, no one would be obligated to uh, maintain their operation for a, a, a specific a specified period of time. Okay. And then the, the last question that he had brought up was regarding notification. And uh, uh, can you help me understand? Because I believe our normal practice is to send mailings within a certain radius. And we can argue about what that radius is. But I believe our, our normal notification includes mailings. Is that accurate for this type of item? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Member, it is. So uh, okay. we, uh, I, th I think virtually all of our uh, uh, appli any application that requires a public hearing has a mailing associated with it. Uh, the the radius uh, around a site it is very much uh, you create a map and you create a buffer around a particular parcel uh, and then any property uh, that touches that buffer uh, gets a notice. Uh, there we get lots of feedback on what that distance is. Uh, it, you know, no matter no matter how big the distance is, there's going to be someone right outside that buffer that, w that wanted a notice. Um, but it is part of our standard practice uh, that the, the neighborhood gets a notice. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Councilmember Lohman. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Nelson and Mayor. Uh, you covered most of the items there, but I wanted to just dive uh, into that first request, you know, they, uh, they, that they responded had, had asked about in terms of, of uh, programs that last forever the government sets uh, sets up and puts together. Um, so what I was curious about with that particular um, uh, comment, and I, and I wanted to have a little more uh, discussion about, are you aware of, uh, Mr. Centenario, any other municipality that has a trigger uh, that would, you know, for, for example, like what was being requested here uh, for either private institutions, nonprofit institutions, or government entities uh, that would trigger after a year of review that would reduce that time down. Are you aware of any municipality uh, in the state or in the country that does something like that with the land use uh, requirement like that? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Member, I'm not aware of a, a trigger of that nature. No. Oh. Um, and uh, if that were uh, done, uh, could that be enforceable if it was beyond the uh, uh, beyond the city itself? Uh, so uh, obviously, if a requirement like that was set up for a government uh, institution, uh, it would be the requirement would be not only for the city, but let's say another municipality came in and did that work. That trigger would probably also be a part of that trigger as well. Is that something that we could even enforce on other municipalities? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Member, I, I don't believe uh, the city code would apply uh, within other municipalities. So maybe I'm not understanding the question. Well, no, I'm just trying to understand what the respondent was uh, was asking, and I, I'm not sure that I'm completely following this either. So um, uh, if, if the question isn't clear, uh, it's, it's believe me, it's not in how I'm asking the question. Uh, I, I'm just not understanding what what uh, what the request is here that is done. Uh, I, I think you've done a good enough job of, of responding to that. I'm just trying to figure out how we would go about trying to uh, implement this. And I think the concern that I'm hearing is that, uh, you know, how can we enforce that? But it doesn't sound like that's something that's traditionally done uh, or ha that you're aware of uh, that's uh, that's been done uh, in other municipalities uh, uh, with a land use uh, example. Yeah, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Member, yeah, I think there's a lot of municipalities that that, that don't have an interim use permit to begin with, uh, where there really isn't any flexibility for land uses to occupy a certain period of time without permanent development. Uh, and we try to have a level of flexibility built into the city code. And uh, and I think that's, that's to the advantage of the community uh, at large. But I think a lot of care uh, needs to be taken in, in terms of what, what an appropriate timeline would be so it sounds like there's some concern about five years. Five years is really just the maximum that's outlined in city code. An interim use permit does not have to be approved for five years. You know, it could be one year, two years, three years. Uh, and that's part of why we review this development to think, well, what, what's an appropriate timeline for right now? 
the discretion certainly could come from staff or from the planning mm -hmm. commission you know, a, a year or less uh could be a recommendation in terms of that so there are, there is some uh check uh there from the public uh, uh or, or representatives uh, who have been appointed to be able to check uh that particular time frame is what i'm hearing you say mm -hmm. yes well uh mayor that's all i have and if there's anything else mayor i'd be happy to move this let me get one more question uh, uh council member d'alessandro and then council member carter no oh, council member d'alessandro I, I did have one quick uh very quick question uh you mentioned something about a public hearing so is there a public hearing requirement for this usage uh, mr mayor council member uh yes the the public hearing would occur with uh, before the planning commission right okay that's right and you mentioned it would be the planning the planning commission's discretion that's correct very good okay uh, i just wanted to make one other um com well you know what I'll, i'm good thanks very good also anything else seeing nothing uh councilman maloman do you want to consider action on this yeah mayor i'd moved uh to adopt an ordinance um as discussed uh, uh, in this meeting, I'm trying to figure out how to get those uh, edits uh, that we had mentioned there uh, through the uh, city attorney uh, to the staff report, amending the city code to create a definition uh, for temporary pandemic or emergency service facilities, add the use as an interim use throughout the city and establish performance standards uh, for the use. We have a second. 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 We have a motion by Councilmember Lohman and a second by Councilmember Carter to adopt the ordinance. And to be clear, it is to create a definition for a temporary pandemic, comma, epidemic, comma, or emergency service facility, as agreed to earlier. And Mayor, just to be clear, and to make those that same uh, phrase edit throughout the balance of the proposed ordinance. I would be disappointed if you did not do that, Ms. Vandershad. So, exactly. <laughs> Keep the record clear. Yep, thank you. We have a motion and a second. Any council discussion? I, I do have one, just one quick ask, Mr. Mayor. In, in reference specifically to the, the uh, our, our friend uh, who asked some questions tonight here in the audience, um, if there was a specific, it sounded like there might be a specific use case in, in the neighborhood that um, might be worth following up on just to understand if there's, if there is something different than what we expected going on. I'm just wondering if we could take some action on that, maybe um, get, get the, our, our resident the information that he needs to get in contact with somebody in planning. Uh, I would agree. Uh, something like that, and I appreciate you bringing that yeah. up. Uh, that would be as we get to 8.4. Yes, that's sir. where that would be most appropriately brought up, and we can certainly direct totally staff to do so. Thank you, sir. Uh, as we are, we need things germane to the uh, the motion in the second here, Good. and uh, but I appreciate you bringing that up, and we will get to that. So, no further council discussion. Mr. Brillard, Carter, aye. Coulter, aye. D'Alessandro, aye. Loman, aye. Martin, aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Councilmember Lohman. Summary publication. I forgot about that. Move to adopt resolution authorizing summary publication of the ordinance. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Lohman, a second by Councilmember Carter for a summary publication. Any no further council discussion on this? Mr. Brillard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. And Mayor, just to be clear for the record, um, I interpreted the motion that was made previously to adopt the ordinance to also be a direction to staff to make that edit um, in the summary as well, which you all just adopted. I think that is a, a an accurate assumption. Okay. Commander Shed. Yep. So that will affect the title and whatnot. So I just wanted to be clear to folks in case anyone was watching and listening at home that there will be those edits made throughout. I think that is that is correct. Good. Thank you much. Thank you, Mr. Centenario. Appreciate it. We can move on to our item eight on our agenda, our organizational business. We have three items, uh, organizational business, uh, more, more study items basically, things we uh, are basically for discussion only. Um, and our item 8.1, 
is a discussion on uh, the Dawn Clubhouse replacement and course improvements that we've been talking about. And uh, we have with us tonight uh, Susan Faust, our Deputy Director of Park and Recreation, and Peter Kervers, our golf course manager, to lead us through this and to explain why the bunkers need replacement, because I never play in the bunkers, so I'm, I'm not sure that... Uh, it's, uh, Thank you for all for laughing for that. At that, <laughs> Ms. Fowles, good evening. Welcome. Good, good evening, um, uh, Mayor and Council members. So tonight we will present a conceptual design to replace the clubhouse at Dewan and a preliminary golf course design that addresses potential improvements um, and provide pro project cost estimates. We have a brief. 15 minute, we have a brief 15 minute presentation and then we'll allow some time at the end for any questions that the council may have. Uh, presenting with me this evening um, are Glenn Wagaspak. He's the project lead from HGA and Kevin Norby, our golf course architect from Norby Golf uh, Course Design and Peter Kervers, our Dewan Golf Course Manager is also available for, uh, for any questions. So in September, staff hosted a community open house for residents to provide their input on what they would like to see improved um, in both the clubhouse and on the course. Uh, consultants and staff were present to really listen, um, answer questions, and provide some information. Um, this slide um, was taken from the open house. We had over uh, approximately 100 community members that attended the open house. Um, this included golfers uh, who golf at Dewan and neighbors who live around the golf course. We received some really great input. You know, I would say the majority of our guests expressed support for um, some improvements um, in both to the clubhouse and for course improvements. Um, prior to the open house, we completed a survey about a 21 question survey and we re received nearly 700 responses again we just received some really valuable input uh, that we included in this preliminary design process this next slide i think really captures the kind of the consistent themes uh, that we that we heard um, through the survey and at the open house as far as the club the clubhouse Overall, people you know, feel that the club base is pretty outdated um, and in poor condition. Um, expanded restrooms. You know, the restroom facilities that we have in the clubhouse are small. Uh, they're not ADA accessible. Um, and uh, folks would like to see um, them expanded. We also heard consistently um, that people wanted improved and expanded outdoor seating areas. Right now, there's a very small area um, kind of on the southwest side that has just a couple tables. Um, and this really isn't adequate for what people prefer. You know, right now, um, what people do is they'll come in, they'll uh, play a round of golf, and they'll go off location um, to have their food and beverage. Another thing we heard um, consistently was an expanded food options. Um, on the survey, we received a significant number of, of individual requests for what types of food people wanted. Um, but overall, we heard that they wanted, they wanted more, they wanted maybe higher quality food, um, that they would stay um, after a round of golf if, uh, if we were able to provide that. Full alcohol, um, they don't pr prefer to have the, the three, two uh, beer options that we are currently able to provide. And then we also heard um, a desire for larger space, for gatherings, for banquets, um, for events. And on the course, um, I think the, the number one thing that we heard um, probably from every person who provided input was um, redoing the bunkers, um, redoing the size, location, shape, and uh, specifically improving the sand. We also uh, heard about improving practice in putting greens, um, making them larger, and providing some permanent restrooms on the course. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Glenn from HGA. 
Thank you, Susan. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. My name is Glenn Wagesbeck. I'm an architect with HGA. Um, I led the team that helped um, Susan and staff develop uh, clubhouse replacement concepts. So I'll kind of walk you through um, a few things today. Uh, a design for a concept for the replacement of the clubhouse, a couple of uh, options um, with cost estimates associated with them, and then a potential project schedule, kind of an example schedule that kind of shows the scope of the design phase and the construction phase and how that timing might occur. So starting with the clubhouse replacement concept, you know, I might add another one of the challenges of the existing building that we really tried to solve that might have been the starting point for this is that all of the spaces in the building are open to one another, a pro shop, dining area, restrooms, you have to move through those spaces in order to, to do, perform any of those functions. So you'll notice in this concept diagram, there's a central lobby. And off of that central lobby are restrooms, the dining area, the pro shop, golf offices, um, also league storage and league function. Um, and then that lobby can pr also provide a welcoming entry. Currently the building presents you with the staff entry that's locked to um, any visitors. Um, the other thing that Susan mentioned that's in this diagram too is a sheltered seating area. There's seating currently around the building, but it's not protected at all, either from weather or golf balls. Uh, so we're thinking, you know, if we can provide some of that sheltered seating adjacent to uh, the dining room in the cafe, we can kind of uh, multiply the usefulness of that space. And then finally, in this um, diagram, you see on the left a ramp to underground cart storage. Uh, we'd be proposing that the this building would have a basement. And that basement would serve to house 65 electric golf carts, also some building mechanical spaces. If you go to the next slide, you can see how a little more of a hard line drawing, less of a diagram of how that might start to fit on the site. Um, you can, this is a plan diagram. You can see to the north of the building, the parking lot, which is gets a little reconfigured with a drop off. And I'll show you more of that detail in the next slide. Um, you'll also notice that the green golf, whoops, if you back up, back up to the plan slide, thanks. The green golf pro shop extends a little bit to the south. So it's got great views of starting tees, the ninth and 18th green, the practice green, just really good view of the course. And then that covered patio faces south facing the course. So this provides, and these images on the right kind of show, what a sense of arrival and connection to the outdoors through windows, um, indoor outdoor connections at dining areas that could be created with sliding doors, um, and then sheltered outdoor areas to protect seating. Now, if you advance to the site plan diagram, um, the building uh, kind of roof footprint or roof outline is in black there. So you can see it on the south side of the parking, which we're reconfiguring. Um, trying to hit 175 parking stalls um, and taking a little bit more space. So pushing the parking a little bit towards West 110th Street um, and adding some replaced, reconfigured and kind of regraded parking area adjacent to the road roadway. Um, the existing building, it may be a little bit hard to see, but it's just to the Southwest um, and overlapping a little bit with the new uh, footprint. So if you move to the next one, so we've got a couple of replacement options and their respective costs. What we're calling option A is a simple replacement of the facility with some upgrades. So it includes all of the current program uses, that is a lobby, golf offices, pro shop, restrooms, etc. Some upgrades to food service space, um, upgraded restrooms, Susan mentioned so the kind of non-accessible or non-code compliant restrooms in the building now, those would have to be upgraded. And also the addition of the underground cart storage space. A cart stage and area would be provided adjacent to the building. Um, and then patio dining, and indoor and outdoor dining would accommodate 80 seats total, 40 indoors, 40 outdoors. And the overall square footage of the building is 10,801 square feet. Um, roughly half of that um, is the footprint. So there's basement underneath, 
uh, and a first floor. And that cost, as, cost comes out to be a project cost, total bottom line cost is $6.24 million. Now option B represents um, an expansion and sort of enhanced dining. So it includes all of the functionality of option A, all of those spaces, but expands the kitchen and dining area um, to accommodate potentially an outside food and beverage vendor. Um, it would include, because of the larger dining area, larger public restrooms, and then also accommodate more seating indoors and outdoors, a total of 120 seats. Um, that would be 60 indoors and 60 outdoors. Um, it's a little bit larger at 12,250 square feet. And the cost, total cost for that um, option B would be $6.88 million. Um, the next slide shows what that might look like. So both of these options would look very similar to each other. This is kind of a artist conceptual view of this. Looking from the south, so from the golf course side, looking towards the building, the building would really act as a porch. So it's a gathering space. It's very open and glassy. You can see there's covered seating areas on the right and the opportunity for some outdoor seating between the golf course and cart movement and the building. And on the left-hand side of the image is where the golf um, pro shop would occur. So from a schedule standpoint, um, we kind of took a stab here at a, at a sample. We don't know exactly when the project would start, but assuming say a November referendum passes, um, that includes this, uh, this project, there'd be eight weeks of schematic design, so two months, uh, two months of design development, two months of construction documentation, and then finally that would go out for bid for another eight weeks. Um, and then we would propose um, organize, or um, scheduling the construction to start in the off season to provide the least disruption to golf operations as possible. So what you see here on the schedule, you see a start in September and it's about a nine month process that would end um, end of May. And Kevin will talk a little bit about how golf course um, scope can get um, folded into this. Thank you, Glenn. And I'm just going to pull up another document here for Kevin. While you're doing that, I'll briefly uh, introduce myself. My name is Kevin Norby. I'm a golf course architect. We are based in Carver, Minnesota. Been looking at this project for a number of months. Are you are you pulling that up, Susan, or am I supposed to help? Yep. I am sorry. It's taking me just a Great. brief second. We've done a number of projects locally that might be similar to this. Um, number of projects for the Minneapolis Park Board and City of St. Paul and so forth. So, um, so this is a uh, this is an overall plan of the golf course. And again, Glenn commented, you know, here's the kind of the new clubhouse location. It's very similar to the old location, but what we've done is sort of move things around in order to make room for this new larger putting green. One of the things we heard sort of loud and clear was that, you know, the golfers would like to have um, a better area to practice. Um, and the putting green there is quite small. We've also taken this, what what's currently number nine green, and we've actually um, moved it or relocated it slightly to the south. And the numbers are different here. You don't probably recognize that, but we've flip-flopped the nines. So one is actually the old 10 and 10 is the old one and 18 would be nine. But um, we're kind of just trying to reorganize the space here to get a little more parking, a little larger clubhouse, a little better practice facilities. And really one of the, the, the maybe overriding concerns is that we've got some fairly serious safety issues currently a lot of golfers are hitting balls on this whole number nine here and actually hitting the existing clubhouse. So by relocating and reconfiguring things, we're able to get a little better separation there. We're actually also able to improve the relationship here between this green and the clubhouse 
as it currently stands with the clubhouse sitting here and this green sitting here, people are hitting the ball over the green, hitting the clubhouse, or they're hitting it out of the bunkers and hitting the clubhouse or hitting people that are up near the clubhouse. So um, by loosening things up a little bit, we've been able to address those uh, concerns. Um, the other thing I think that we heard sort of loud and clear here was that, you know, that golfers would like to see improvements um, to the sand bunkers or the sand traps. There are currently uh, 52, I believe, sand traps on the golf course. They're really quite large. They've they've grown over time and um, and are really excessively large. The sand is not in very good shape. The edges are eroded. Um, so we, we, we would propose to reconstruct the bunkers, moving some of them slightly up the fairway, reducing the size um, so that um, this is maybe a course that would be a little more friendly to seniors and women and juniors, uh, which is your primary client base at Duan. Um, also reducing the square footage would actually uh, re reduce some of the maintenance burden and allow the maintenance staff to sort of focus on, you know, other things like mowing and filling divots and, you know, just regular maintenance. So um, really no major, no rerouting of the course whatsoever. We're not really trying to change the course. It's a very successful, very busy, very popular golf course. Um, so we're really just trying to sort of modernize it a little bit and bring it up to date, um, address some of the safety issues. I think one of the other things that I'll just point out here is that we are proposing um, to do a number of forward tees. And so these are, again, um, tees that would be used primarily by juniors, um, maybe what we call super seniors, you know, people who are maybe 70 or even 80 years old that are still enjoying the game. Um, and so we have a number of holes where we're building these new forward tees. They're quite small, fairly inexpensive to build. Um, and in doing some of that, um, we do have a, a very few areas where we're realigning cart paths and just trying to get people moving in the right direction. Again, some of that safety, some of that's just circulation and playability. So if you want to go to the next slide, I'll kind of touch on um, kind of the phasing here. So as Glenn pointed out, we really broke this down into two phasing alternatives. Susan's pulling that up, I'll, I'll just kind of start describing it. But the first alternative, like the clubhouse, is a somewhat more limited uh, scope of work. So it would involve renovating all of the existing bunkers. That would include moving some of them, eliminating a couple, reducing the size, putting new sand and new drainage uh, in there, uh, in the bunkers, both fairway and greenside bunkers. And then we would simply um, do some limited irrigation improvements, basically where we impact the existing irrigation system. Um, we would also then construct those new forward tees and um, reconstruct a couple of the existing tees that are sort of pointed in the wrong direction and again, kind of create some playability and, and safety issues. We'd also then reconstruct that number nine putting green, the new practice green, and we would also um, make some improvements on hole number two. Hole number two is a hole that when you stand on the tee, you can't see who's in front of you. And so it creates a pretty significant safety issue. Um, we would just do a little bit of grading there to lower the hillside, um, make it more visible, move some of the bunkers out of the way, just kind of improve overall playability of that hole. We would also then replace or upgrade the irrigation control package. So that's sort of the, the brains of the, the irrigation system that allows the superintendent to put water where he needs it, when he needs it. Um, and that's an outdated uh, old control package. It's about $60,000. Just brings that up to date so that it works with the rest of the, uh, the system. The total price for that, um, we're estimating at 3.3 million dollars and again this would be a somewhat limited um, focusing on you know really bunkers and safety next slide option b again like the clubhouse is a more comprehensive 
um, look at the golf course. It includes all of the things we talked about in option A, but it also includes um, also going in and expanding the irrigation pond and replacing the irrigation system on the rest of the golf course. So right now you have an irrigation system that was installed in 2006. Those typically last about 25 years. Um, today, that system would then be about 15 years old. If this happens in two or three years, you'd have a system that's 18 years old. Um, one idea would be to replace that entire system at the same time so we don't have to close the course um, or impact play at some future date. Um, and then the other thing that this includes is um, some additional um, wildlife buffers and, uh, you know, sort of ecological improvements. So again, uh, that partially involves uh, this irrigation pond, enlarging the irrigation pond, but it also involves things like putting in buffers and, and wildlife nesting boxes and that sort of thing. Um, and then again, installing the rest of the irrigation system. So that entire price comes in or estimate comes in at about $5.8 million. Now these also include um, a contingency because we're very early on in the process. It includes a contingency. Um, and I think we've got 10% in there, Susan, if I'm not mistaken. And then um, we've also got an escalator in there for um, three years of just inflationary increases, trying to understand what's happening to you know, pricing of materials. Um, and then these numbers do include final design, engineering, um, construction observation services, that sort of thing. So there's a, you know, probably close to a million dollars in just contingencies, final design, and escalators. Yeah, and, and so so next steps in the project. Um, you know, this project will be included in discussions about um, possible local option sales tax funding. Um, if that moves forward, uh, we would complete uh, separate RFPs for the building architect and for the golf, golf, uh, golf course architect to provide those final designs and construction documents. And I just wanted to say that it's currently planned um, in the CIP for 2024. Um, certainly, we would look to be doing um, some additional uh, community engagement um, when we get to the, the design of the final design of, of both the, the course and the clubhouse. And with that, um, we would, um, all of us would be um, willing to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you for the information and the detail provided there. Uh, a couple of questions that I had. So you mentioned the, the two possible sizes of the, the clubhouses is uh, 10,800 square feet and 12,250 square feet. What's the current size of the clubhouse? Forgive me for not knowing that. What, what's the current size? I can answer that, Susan. It's 4,100 square feet. So we're talking a significantly larger clubhouse in a variety of different areas, right? All right. Correct. And the work, whether it would be on the clubhouse or on the course, uh, how would that affect playability over the course of the seasons? Obviously, with the, the clubhouse, the way you lined that up, it looked like it would be from September to May, which wouldn't be as big of a deal. But the work on the, on the course itself, how would that affect playability? So I can answer that. Um, so in option A, which is the more limited scope, we actually don't feel we need to close the golf course. Most of those improvements um, are, are really just uh, bunker improvements, some minimal irrigation. Um, there is a couple of greens that would be reconstructed. So we may have, um, we may have a temporary green or some temporary tees, but we wouldn't actually close the golf course. We would start that project in probably, um, you know, July or August, early August. And we would do the work on that August, September, October, November, um, we would have that, basically the goal would be to have that pretty well buttoned up by the end of the season um, so that we could uh, have the course playable again come spring. Now that would probably be something like June 1st or 
something, but uh, while the while the greens mature, so there would be some limited disruption, but it wouldn't be a closure of the course. If we did option B, we would actually close the course on a schedule that would be similar to that proposed for the clubhouse. We would start in October. We would work on that in October and November, actually even December, because we would be digging, um, enlarging that irrigation pond, and that that is actually best done in uh, when the weather is colder. Then we would finish that work in April, May, June, and July with the goal of having all of the work complete by August 1st so that the course could then mature through the rest of the season and it would open the following spring, probably immediately in the spring. So that would be an entire season of revenue uh, lost while the course is closed. Thank you. Council questions. I see Council Member Martin and then Council Member Lohman. Council Member Martin. Uh, thank you very much. And this uh, this question is a little more broad, so uh, potentially if staff is going to follow up by, on this later, that, that works as well. Uh, it looks like a lot of the comments option B on the clubhouse itself kind of addresses usability, uh, the dining options. I'm curious, option B in terms of bunkers irrigation playability. Just based on the investments that we're seeing other municipalities make in their golf courses or, or not make. I guess, are, are we viewing something like option B as being integral for um, this to be a competitive facility over the longer term? Are we seeing a lot of, of other cities making substantial investments in their courses? So I'm just curious how this would help us stack up over the longer term in terms of drying players. You know, um, Dwan is a very successful, very busy golf course. And, you know, like all golf courses, you know, these are I guess, continually growing and evolving, you know, facilities. And one of the things that deteriorates maybe most quickly it is the bunkers. And I would say that right now we are probably working on four or five municipal golf courses that are replacing irrigation and bunkers. So this would not, you would not be certainly the only one. You would be one of many, even in the Twin Cities here, we're seeing um, City of Apple Valley, uh, City of River Oaks, uh, Minneapolis. Um, we did, you know, Invergrove Heights uh, recently. Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, we're we're kind of in a heyday here with golf, where rounds are up, participate, tar- participation is up. So, uh, courses and municipalities are finally, um, you know, able to sort of fix some of these things they've been putting off for years, and that would, you know, maybe certainly be the case with. Um, with Duan. Uh, again, I would point out that your, rel- your irrigation system is relatively new, and today that system's only 15 years old, but by the time this system were, this, this project were renovated, renovated, or this course was renovated, it would be almost 20 years old, and we would be within five years, uh, you know, of its sort of normal life expectancy. So, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Lohman and then Councilmember Nelson. Councilmember Lohman. Thank you, Mayor. Well, I just want to say uh, if the plans look right the way I see them, maybe the, this uh, this design uh, change will keep some of those golf balls that the mayor has been hitting out of my yard. So I uh, appreciate that change. <laughs> um, don't don't count uh, on that. <laughs> don't count on it. <laughs> yeah, you keep them out of the bunkers, all right. Um uh, so one question that I did have, you guys did do a very nice job on that open house. Uh, my family went over uh, to see it. Um, uh, it was fantastic. Um, uh, one of the questions that I did have is a former uh, council per, uh, person had asked uh, whether or not uh, any consideration was uh, made to moving the clubhouse from where its current location is uh, and uh, setting it up down on Overlook. Was that considered at all? Um uh, in the process and just wanted to, uh, uh, check in on that, uh, piece. A couple other questions I have too, but. You know, it really became a spatial, uh, analysis. And when we started looking at, even though this seems like it's a relatively large clubhouse compared to what's there, um, it was certainly most cost effective to simply reconfigure what currently exists. Um, and and work with that space. If we were to move it, we would not only need to relocate 
parking lots and and likely have to reconfigure the golf course because you have to have the two starting and the two finishing holes near the clubhouse. Um, and so again, one of the things we heard loud and clear is people didn't want us to change the course. They just wanted to, to fix what they didn't like about it um, and sort of address the maintenance issue. So I think moving it to another location would have been much more costly and honestly, uh, not really necessary. Um. You know, the mayor uh, has, has talked about centers of community, um, and obviously this would be uh, uh, one of them. And, you know, as I, I look at the, uh, the kind of the footprint of of the uh, uh, of the clubhouse or, or what we're looking at trying to do, um, kind of the question that comes to my mind is, you know, what is this, you know, how is this going to be utilized uh, in the evening? And, and folks that are beyond golf, you know, we're talking about weddings, banquets, uh, is there going to be uh, the possibility of expansion uh, in the area? I'm just trying to figure out uh, in terms of this whole uh, scope. I know we're still working on the, the centers of ideas uh, or centers of community, but uh, how can this uh, uh, this building and resource, was it considered as we looked at this in terms of trying to uh, have additional uses uh, in the off uh, peak season uh, uh, for this particular building and expansion? Susan, do you want me to address that? Sure, Glenn. Why don't you start, and I'll add if I um, have any information to add. Yeah, one of the one of the things that we discovered or realized about the site was how constrained it is. Um, when you start to add assembly spaces like banquet spaces, um, gathering spaces um, to a building, it really bumps up the parking requirement, and parking is already a challenge on the site. So between parking, kind of safety setbacks, buffers from the, the course itself, um, there's really not a lot of space to expand. Um, that said, what we tried to do, at least with the option B, is expand the dining area so that it could serve uh, for, you know, league banquets and, you know, birthday parties, meetings, that sort of thing. Yeah, and Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Lowland, if I could just add, um, so, so we did, we, we discussed it quite a bit, you know, how we can um, continue to have Dewan be a center of community in Bloomington. And as, as Glenn mentioned, during the golf season, parking is a challenge because we're such a busy golf course. Um, but we would envision that we would be able to use the new clubhouse in the off season, in the winter months, um, especially as, as Glenn mentioned with that expanded kind of indoor um, space, we could do some programming there and we would be able to host um, different events um, for the community. Thanks, I appreciate that. Cause I know that's uh, one thing that that's a priority and something we've been, uh, I know the mayor has been uh, pushing for that. And I want to be sure that we ask that question. Uh, Cause I'm just curious about the, how this would be utilized. Uh, if you could talk a little bit about expansionary, uh, I know it's, you, you talked about it being crammed, but from a long-term uh, standpoint, and Councilmember Martin uh, talked about this in the mayor a little bit, um, how would we look to expand uh, uh, this for future uses? So, for example, if we saw with our demographics changing where um, uh, from golfing, we had um, more people who needed uh, daycare, let's say, that wanted to do golfing, let's say. Um, how would one, and I'm not, not saying that's what's happening here, but how would we you know, fit that into this particular uh, location that, or, or any changes we want to make? Um, how is that being thought of as we're looking at this long term? So, so I can take a stab, um, Mayor, Council Member, Council Members, Lowman, Lowman. I think that the, the only way that we would be able to expand the clubhouse um, would be a little bit at the expense of the course. Um, we would have to shorten the course um, in order to, to accomplish that. Um, and, and as uh, Mr. Norby mentioned, that is something that we really heard from um, the survey that we heard from at the uh, open house that that's what people did not want. Uh, they didn't want to impact the course. They didn't want to shorten the course. Um, it would, that would be the option um, would be to, to uh, expand and, 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 and shorten some of the course in, a, in, a, in order to do that. Yeah, and, and I, I might add in here, we still have constraints with our parking. So in the proposal, we have 175 parking stalls and we found that's what we need now for golf. 
And if we are going to expand into other concurrent activities going on, we have absolutely no plan B for where they would park. Um, and we certainly couldn't park in the neighborhoods or across 110th or Xerxes. So we, we really discussed our parking limitations, it, which dictated what we could do with the building as well. I really appreciate that. And, and finally, my last question is around, uh, you know, one of our, our priority priorities that we have going forward. If you'd like to opine, I know you talked briefly about it within some of the discussion around sustainability with in terms of the building. You did talk about the irrigation, uh, but I'd like to hear about, you know, in terms of the standards in which if we compare ourselves to other uh, uh, clubhouses in terms of what we're proposing here uh, and these changes, uh, how does that fit into the, uh, you know, in terms of our priorities and how, in terms of how we are uh, trying to be a more sustainable uh, community? Susan, I can't speak to the priorities of the city, but I can speak to kind of what's contained in the current scope. Um, for instance, we're trying to capture best practices, but we haven't captured in the scope any kind of certification process, that sort of thing. But best practices might include something like using a geothermal uh, heat pump system, for instance. So there is a little bit of cost associated with a more energy efficient system. We've tried to capture some of that as best practices in the in the estimate. So assumed a, a certain level of construction um, equivalent to um, other you know local uh, projects that we're familiar with or have, or have completed ourselves, such as like the Brookview Community Center. Um, which you might be familiar with or on the golf course there, just to kind of establish level set for a reasonable estimate. But we did not address things like, you know, solar power generation, um, gray water reclamation, those kinds of things. Yeah, and Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Lohman, that would be something that we would address when we got into the detailed design phase. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add one thing is, is it says with the basement uh, is going to electric cart fleet versus an all gas fleet, which we're currently limited to having. Um, so that would be another thing working towards. I don't think there's a clubhouse that's been built in the last 25 years that hasn't moved towards an electric cart fleet. I appreciate that uh, your, your time and I want to just let you know as we move forward with this, uh, that's something that uh, I know myself and a number of other council members are going to uh, uh, really key in on. Uh, certainly we're, you know, we're, we're looking at, at those particular items. So I appreciate your, uh, uh, I know we're at the beginning phases, but just want to let you know, kind of give you a tip my hat and let you know uh, we're looking for that stuff. Thank you. Council member Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. A uh, few questions here. Um, there was discussion of uh, dining room, the size of that, um, event space, that sort of thing. And so my question is, would that be a year round facility like a restaurant that people could go to? Would it be um, something that catered to and attempted to market to and attract non golfers? So uh, or would that just be to try to encourage people that were golfing to stay after their round and um, have some food and hang out with their uh, foursome or maybe a couple groups there or for, you know, smaller uh, uh, parties that came and used the facility? Thank you, Mayor, Council Members, uh, Council Member Nelson. That's a great question. And, and we have had a lot of conversations around that. I think with the different options for the clubhouse, um, if we move forward with the, the option A, which is mainly just for kind of replacing what we have, um, you know, our food and beverage operation would be operated um, by the city. Um, and at that point, we would kind of continue as having our uh, food and beverage operation open um, only during the golf season. But if we were to look at that other option, the option B, um, and we were working with an outside food vendor, you know, that would be something we would have to consider. Um, we, we, we've talked about maybe just having um, uh, an outside food vendor come in um, and operate during the golf season. But if it was something where we felt like there was a you know, request from from our community um, and from council 
um, and we could find a, a you know a, a food vendor that would be you know willing and would be able to operate year round. We could certainly consider that. Um, you know now in the restaurant business is a bit of a challenge. You know with staffing um, and all of that. So so that would be something that we would definitely um, you know want to continue conversations as we move this project forward. Thank you. Um, I know that there has been a extensive work at this course with, I, I believe it's the Audubon Society and it's certified. Uh, would any of the renovations at the course impact that certification or the work that they have done there? Yeah, the renovations on the course would not negatively impact that certification. They could actually uh, enhance that and uh, right now, it's under a uh, uh, Audubon Sanctuary certification. There is actually a, a category that if we took the, the steps to enhance those wildlife areas, um, we could actually pursue something called a classic certification, which is for courses that have undergone a renovation. So um, certainly wouldn't negatively, it could actually enhance or improve that certification. Okay. Great. I'm very glad to hear that because uh, that is a beautiful course when you play it and, and the work that they've done is is really quite amazing. Um, I think uh, Mr. Kerbers had uh, mentioned about uh, concurrent uses and the difficulty of having, uh, or uh, maybe it was you, Mr. Norby, that uh, had mentioned that the parking was not adequate um, to have concurrent uses for banquet or restaurant um, along with golf, but what about non-concurrent use? Uh, would there be a way to schedule events outside of normal golf hours, whether during the season or off peak times or block it off uh, or anything like that? Or maybe it's that's too deep. Maybe that's future decision. It, it is a little future decision, but I think, uh, you know, the winter time is it would be open. Um, but when you when you talk about off hours, I mean, the golf course is open from sunrise to sunset. So our off hours would be late evening, say in the summertime, maybe nine o'clock or later, and trying to envision exactly what that would look like or appeal to would, I don't know what that would look like at this point. Sorry, I forgot the sun stays up that late in the summer. <laughs> My dog's very angry. Um, I, just the financial side of this, um, there was mention of the need every 25 years for the bunkers and the irrigation. Um, what are we doing with regards to our working capital accounts to make sure that we don't, we're not in a situation in the future to be dealing with those through a bonding, a lost or some other type of account? What are we, you know, how do we account for those in the normal operations and save up for those going into the future so we don't? Have to address that in the future mr mayor and council members uh council member nelson that's that's a good question um the depending on the way that a project like this would get financed uh we would have a, a couple of options for how the council handled the budgeting usually when we do like general obligation um, debt the debt service will get assigned to the specific department and especially with our enterprise funds that's how we've operated um, that's not unusual and it's a best business practice at the same time uh, it uh, has the effect of um, negatively impacting that working capital balance right so if you'll recall what happened with the bloomington ice garden uh, is that we're we're seeing that the working capital goal there is is stretched a little bit because of the debt service from improvements a couple of years ago. Uh, so that would be a future discussion for the council about how you want to assign um, debt service uh, in whatever financing structure that we pursue. I think the the other question is just, uh, again, trying to forecast uh, uh, profitability for the golf operation. And as we look at our long-term model for the, for the Dwan portion of our golf fund, uh, we are forecasting revenues over expenses uh, every year going out more than 10 years. Uh, we, we cleared about $250,000. Uh, that's what we're estimating for 2021. Uh, we haven't closed the books yet, but that's the, that's the current estimate. 
uh, and we would actually have a working capital um, in the Gulf Fund very close to the goal for this year were it not for the Highland Greens piece of it, which we're still um, carrying a bogey on. Uh, so our, our current working capital uh, balance is about 50% of goal. Uh, and that discussion about the future of Highland Greens will factor into the health of working capital for the overall Gulf Fund as we go forward. But I think the, so there I went on a very long and rambling answer and I'm gonna give you the short one. We're forecasting um, more revenue than expenses for the Gulf, for the Duan operation in the next 10 years. That sounds good. Um, so my next question is, can we just call the Highland Greens a mulligan and on? Uh, we have talked about that, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, and uh, you know we can bring our, our Chief Financial Officer back in just to talk about whatever um, uh, <laughs> whatever potential issues that causes from a, a financial management perspective, but that is something that we have talked about, just writing that off. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of the space, there was a, a answer that it's difficult to expand without impacting the course just curious if we've looked at all at a two-story building if we could expand the usage the revenue potential if there was a business case for it if that had been analyzed at all we stayed away from a two-story building really because it incurs the cost of you know two stairs an elevator um, and we were trying to keep the building as economical as we could but it would certainly be possible. Okay. And I appreciate that. Um, I would just add that you avoid an extra foundation or additional foundation, excavation, things of that nature when you when you do that. So um, it, that that's the reason I asked that, but agreed that you have to have access to ADA and make sure everyone can use it. So I appreciate that. Um, Will the new carts, the electric carts, are they all new and will they have GPS? So I know how far away from the green I am. <laughs> well, Council Member Nelson, you're getting way ahead because you're we're assuming how far you hit your drive on every hole. No, we're making but, no uh, assumptions about that, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, Council Member Nelson. And it's not good. <laughs> That's why I need that. Yeah. I don't know that there's a GPS that can calculate that distance, Councilmember Nelson. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. So I, I can tell other stories about that course, so we'll, we'll not go there. Last question, and this one is completely tongue-in-cheek, so I expect no answer, but are have we made any provisions for a number of trees and screening to block the view to a large pile of trash across the river? <laughs> well, those would be very tall trees. <laughs> very good very good well i appreciate the time i appreciate the answers and um you know that is such an amazing course it is such a fun course to play uh the building needs work absolutely and uh, appreciate the efforts on it i'm always i i do want to make sure we're mindful of the business economics of the course and what we're doing there but um it is absolutely a treasure in our city so thank you Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so first, thank you so much for all of your work on this. So I just wanted to go back and clarify, um, related to the irrigation system, if we were to wait and let the current system kind of live out its life and then go back and replace it in the future um, after the other improvements are made, um, what kind of impacts would that have on the course in terms of its operations? Would that be one where we could replace it while people are still, while it's still in operation or would we have to shut down? for a time to replace that irrigation system. Yeah, I'll take that one. So um, again, you know, typically we estimate the life expectancy at 25 years. Um, it's not uncommon for a golf course owner to put that off and to get 30 years out of it. Um, what happens during that time is that you, know, you get more and more breaks and more and more leaks and before long the maintenance staff is sort of consumed by you know these constant repairs and maybe even has one person dedicated as their irrigation technician um 
you're you're actually right on the edge um, where it's hard to make a decision. Do you just pull the trigger and replace it five years early, or you know do you try to get ten years out of it and and come back in ten years? So if you were to wait and close the, uh, I'm sorry, wait and replace the system um, five or ten years later. Um, typically, we would not have to close the golf course in order to replace that system. What I would be concerned about is a couple of things. One, um, the added cost. So you've got over that next five years, if you just assume 4% inflation, you know, a $2 million irrigation system is now going to cost you an extra four or $500,000. But you would also, you wouldn't close the course, but you would have some disruption to play. So just as we do with option A, there's some, some disruption to play and that's likely going to have some impact on revenue. There are just people who are gonna say the course is under construction and I'm not gonna go there. Um, and so you would have that again five years later. Um, if you did option B, I, I think there's some logic in saying Let's just pull the trigger and you know get it done and get it all done and not have to worry about it again for you know 20 or 30 or 40 years. That we, we would also be replacing this new, we would be replacing this irrigation system with an entirely new system. And the the current technology today, we utilize what we call HDPE pipe. It's that rubber pipe you see the utility companies going under the road with. They're, it hasn't been in the ground long enough anywhere for people to know, but they're estimating that that pipe could last a hundred years. Now the sprinklers might not last a hundred years, but um, that's a significant savings uh, down the line and, and up front. Thank you, Mr. Norby. Um, so this next question is related to that and it might be more for the city manager, but if we were to um, get approval through the local option sales tax for funding um, for these improvements and we didn't replace the irrigation system at the time of the improvements and we went back five ten years later to replace them we would have to find another funding mechanism correct mr mayor and council members council member carter that's correct the uh the first step in the local option sales tax process which will be discussed a little bit later uh is authorization from the uh, state legislature to proceed that and each project has to have a defined um, uh, project cost and that's what voters would then um, approve in a referendum if they were to do that and that's the that's the source of the funding you, you would have to either go back for an additional authorization from the legislature and voters or you'd have to identify an alternative revenue source okay thank you that's that's very helpful council additional questions Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thanks very much for all the good work here. I think I speak for, well, I, I don't know how many of us are golfers, but um, I was talking to my wife about this and she's thrilled with the idea, especially better bathrooms. I, I, I guess that's uh, important on this golf course. So thank you for that. Um, uh, I have a question about the irrigation pond itself. So you're you're recommending uh, in option B that that, that get expanded as well as um, I think re- um, relined and everything like that. How does, is, are we also talking about, um, how do, how does the water get gathered there? I'm wondering, is there any kind of, um, uh, reclamation that's done naturally as part of the way that the course is designed or how the irrigation ponds are, that it's pulling the water from the course itself and acting, um, as a catch-all, or is that just whatever rain falls in the area that it's there is what we're picking up, et cetera. I'm just kind of curious if, if there's any, uh, technical improvements being made there. Yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Commissioner D'Alessandro. Um, so currently the, the irrigation system is fed. Peter, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's almost entirely um, through uh, city water, right? It's pumped, correct. We pump yeah. it. To the and, and we would not be changing that in alternative B. Um, we would be enlarging that pond um, and it does get some water from runoff, for instance, from the parking lot or the clubhouse. And so as part of this process, 
we would have the ability to sort of reconfigure those stormwater ponds and make sure that you know this runoff gets directed that way but but the one thing we heard from the maintenance staff was that their pond is so small that they feel like they're really limited in their ability to um, get water where they need water when they need water and so um, the other nice thing about this new irrigation system is that it's much more efficient um, than the system that's there today because it allows them to more closely monitor how much water they put down and where they put it down. So in reality, we probably are going to have more sprinkler heads, but it'll be more efficient, more um, e easier to control. It's more precision, more, more surgical where we put the water. So it'll actually save water. Also, anything else? Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I just have a quick follow-up question to that because this is probably totally on me, but I was very confused because um, I thought I, I thought Councilmember Delisandro had asked about the um, um, the the pond, uh, the storm pond. Is that connected to the irrigation system? And utilize the irrigation system for for uh, watering the park or the the golf course or how do those two things interrelate? Yeah. I guess if they do at all. So runoff from the parking lot currently runs into a small pond near hole 18 or on hole 18. That pond, when it overflows its banks, um, flows into the irrigation pond, and from there um, it's pumped out onto the course. Um, combined with whatever water needs to be added from, you know, the city water supply. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. I appreciate that. Yep. Council, additional questions. Council Member Lohman. So um, I just wanted to check again. I know Council Member Carter had brought up the idea of how much it would cost if you, you uh, pushed it off and did the, uh, uh, you know, did that irrigation system uh, later on. And I thought I heard you say 4% uh, of the uh, of the total cost. I mean, I'm just trying to figure out what that, that cost would be. I heard 100,000, 200,000, help me understand it. Because when I do 4% of, of 2 million, I don't, I don't get anywhere close to, are you right. talking about a rolling year? Help me understand what you mean by that. Yeah, the 4% was just an, if you waited five years and you assumed a 4 percent inflation annually, you know, okay. it would cost an additional 20% after five years. Um, uh, what I was saying is if you didn't do option B and you, and you just fixed whatever irrigation needed to be fixed at the time you did option A, um, you know, you would save roughly a million and a half dollars um, in irrigation expense, but then that expense would be incurred, let's say five years later. Um, plus some, you know, inflationary increase of let's say four percent a year. So you're building that within the in the uh, in the efficiency within the system year in and year out. Ah, okay. Right. All right, I got you. Go. <laughs> Susan, I, I know you showed the slide, but you, can you remind us one last time now? Next steps, where we are in the process, and what next what next steps might be. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you, Mayor, Council Members. So, so really, next steps would be to determine what the funding source will, would be for the project. Um, and then we would go out for uh, an RFP um, for both a uh, building architect for the design of the clubhouse and for a golf course architect um, for the detailed uh, design um, on the course. And then we would include uh, some some additional community engagement as that process moves forward, um, making sure we get you know more input from our golfers um, from the neighborhood on exactly what they would like to see, um, and maybe provide a little bit of direction between you know are, are we ex how extensive um, that we want to to go with those renovations. Very good. Well, thank you, thank you for your work and your direction on this, and extend our thanks to. Uh, and Katri as well. I know she wishes you could have been here. Um, Mr. Norby, uh, Mr. Wagerspack, thank you so very much. And uh, Mr. Kerbers, uh, thank you 
and thanks for the information. Looking forward to continuing the discussion on this. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Next on our agenda is item 8.2, which is another bit of our organizational business, uh, another discussion among staff here, staff and council. And this one regarding the fire station number four project and the CIP bond process. And Lori Economy Scholler, our CFO, is with us. There she is. Good evening. Good evening. And welcome. Council, um, we're just having including this item on fire station four project um, and the CIP bond process just to get a little feedback of um, where we went uh, so far with the fire station. So uh, we, we've had a number of communications and community engagements. We've had elect talk Bloomington. We've had a dedicated city page. We've had um, a number of community information tables at the farmers market. Um, we've had a, the fire station open house information tables. Um, we've had a number of one weeklies in July, September, and December. Um, we've had the, the capital improvement plan uh, from last year um, that mentioned the fire station project coming up, that it was one of the green light projects coming through in 2021 that was going to start planning process. Um, during the year, we've had quarterly uh, project status reports that we've sent out through the one weekly that lists all the projects in 2021 and 22 that we are starting the planning process through. Um, th there was a number of pieces um, in the CIP um, for the 2022 through 2030 projects that um, we also listed that we would be having a spring bond sale for the fire station um, as we gotten the numbers better and better of where that number's at. Um, and then when the council did approve um, at the end of December, the last meeting, um, they did um, approve for the debt issuance and the CIP bonds, I mean, so or the CIP plans. So there was two items at the council and that resolution did approve. The, the resolution was in the, the packet for tonight. Um, the council also um, approved the, um, the consultants that were hired uh, about a, uh, last spring for the project. And then just the bonding process coming up. Um, again, we did the notice of public hearing on December 2nd. We had held um, along, you know, following the state statute for capital improvement bonds. We um, held that public hearing. Um, all of the CIP bonds were listed at the 81 million. We do intend to come back to council. Um, in February with a more exact amount based off of the bids that are coming in on the 24th. Um, the 30 day reverse referendum will end on January 19th. The 2020 or January 24th, um, the 29 bid packages will be before the council. Um, we would get down to a more authorized dollar amount. So we would reduce from 81 million down to hopefully under that 12 and a half million dollar mark, depending on the bids again. Um, we would sell the bonds on the 21st of March and then um, spring construction. So during all this, we've, we've had a, a lot of information that's come to council from being in the CIP um, a number of years for this project, coming through to that it was green lighted that we start planning the project, um, hiring consultants, um, engaging the community, moving through um, the whole planning process. And so one of our questions at the department head level, is there any other time as we're giving the council information on this bonding piece that's coming up? I mean, the bonds are authorized, but we're gonna get down to a, a smaller amount that the council would want us to um, get, give the council more interaction or more, um, a more deliberate authorization that we move forward on this. Um, so on, under um, Minnesota statutes for capital improvement plan bonding, no additional approvals are necessary, but um, we wanted to just engage in conversation about what the council would like in regards to these type of bonds. Um, we've done a number of charter bonds in the past, so the council kind of understands that process. For capital improvement bonding, 
um, the last time the city did a capital funding project was in 2010. And that one was just to refinance the center part of the building. So we really haven't done a new building utilizing the capital improvement bonding. So open to discussion uh, and just getting council's thoughts on that. So your specific question uh, is where in this whole process that if necessary, would, would the council think that an official project approval should fit in somewhere? Is that, is that what the question is? Yes. Okay. Okay. The council thoughts on that or, I mean, I, I guess assuming there's no right or wrong answer here and we're just kind of throwing out ideas and, and suggestions about what we would like to see, I would say, uh, before we we got in in as before we got to the point of no return in my mind so whether that's um prior to the uh, hiring of the consultants whether that's after the consultants and they brought back a, a final proposal you know what the building is going to look like what it's how it's going to what it's going to cost and so on but somewhere along the lines wherever it works that it, it we we've reached the point of no return i think it, it should come back to the council for discussion. And to your point, because it's bonds, I, I think it, you know, it's not required under state law and that kind of thing. But I think from a, a community standpoint, from a council discussion standpoint, just from a, uh, a public policy standpoint, at some point in there, I do think it needs to come back, but not at the point where it's simply, you know, the, the, the cake is baked and we're simply giving a, a, a thumbs up after the wheels are so far you know, so far in motion that we can't stop it or it would be ridiculous to stop it somewhere in there. So I don't know if, if that makes sense or council, if you've got any other ideas on that. Councilmember Martin. Uh, yeah, I'm just kind of along similar lines of thinking. I like the idea of being able to bring the, the consultants on board, have them come back to us with kind of a, a preliminary, hey, what do you think of this? then it allows council to serve as okay does this look like it reflects the community engagement and the feedback that we got through all these process just allows us to kind of compare apples to apples and then give it a thumbs up others can i ask for a question uh, a clarification question you may always ask for thank clarification you. councilman del Sandro. thank you mayor um so, uh, Ms. Economy Schuler, if looking at your question, if you could put that back up there again, I'm just wondering if you can help me de based on the list of things that were there. Maybe can you pinpoint where what the mayor is talking about would fall into this? Like, where would that be in that process? If we were going to bring it back one more time. Sorry, I didn't mean to make you sweat out another PowerPoint glitch there. Yeah, so, so you know, if you think about, like, the one weekly council proven a consultant planning process, wh where would you fit that in if you wanted to, ideally? Lori, I think, we're, I think we're having some uh, uh, audio issues here, Lori. If you could get a little closer to the microphone or... Okay, I think it's closer. I'm still struggling to hear you, I think. I'll just talk really loud. I'm at 100 percent. Oh, there now you're coming back. Yes, there you go. Okay. Um, when the what we would add to the consultant process is when they get to, um, I would say, the design is either 75 percent done or uh, closer between 75 and 100 percent, and they're getting really narrowed in on what the costs are. Because I want to, I want to know from my perspective if the council is going to authorize the bonds that we know the number is going to be 12 and a half million. It's not going to be, oh, consultants are at 75% and they think it's 11. Um, I, I, from my perspective, I want to be closer to the number and I want to make sure I get that number to you as the council member so that when you're giving us the green light or the thumbs up that we can proceed and that we are semi-authorizing the bonds, that you are comfortable with that number and what the impact will be on future tax levies. So we can build that into the consultant's process in the future for bonding projects. Okay. It, 
does that make sense to you? I, obviously, I wasn't involved in the process this t past time, so I'm just kind of learning along. Does does that is that in line with what you were maybe thinking? I, I uh, yes, I, I mean that makes sense. As a if we if we would establish that as the point, that does make sense to me. Though, uh, yeah. If we would use that as the the place where we say, okay, we've got to decide because we have a hard number. We're not guessing on the last 25 percent. We are. We've got a hard number. That would be the point. I think we would make that decision. Is that what you am I understanding it correctly? Mayor and council members, um, yes, that's what I was hoping to get out of this discussion in the comments. Good, good. Thank you, Mayor. Council, additional questions or, or thoughts and input on this? And speak up here. I'm having trouble getting everybody on the screen, so I can't see everybody at once. If you've got your hand up, please let me know. So is everybody in agreement? Did everybody understand what, what we were back and forth there? The, the question that Councilmember D'Alessandro asked, the answer that we got, and kind of where we are in terms of where this would be? If that is the case, a, a big nod perhaps or a thumbs up? Very good. Laurie, does that answer the question you had? Yes, it does. Thank you, Mary. Very good. All right, well, thank you. Have a good rest of your evening. Thanks much. And we will move on to item 8.3, which is our third organizational business discussion, and this being on local option sales tax. And we've kind of touched on it a couple of times already tonight, uh, but we've got, uh, I think, a little more in-depth detail. Uh, Mr. Verbrugge is going to lead us through this and take us through the discussion. Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Actually, I'm going to hand off the presentation to uh, Lori, and then I'll come back uh, during the discussion uh, at that point. Very good. That's why Lori wasn't going anywhere when she was done and I was saying goodnight to her. She was still sticking around. That makes sense now. Please go ahead. And again, Lori, we're a little bit of audio issue with you. I'm not sure what the deal might be. There might be too many people in my house on um, the internet. And per if, perhaps is it just here in the council chamber or uh, folks at home? Are you having trouble hearing as well? Yep. Yeah. I think you're just going to have to use your outside voice, Lori. Okay, I'll use my outside voice. So, local option sales tax discussion this evening. Um, and part of the information the council received uh, to date, nearly 80 local units have received the local option sales tax, including Minneapolis, St. Paul, outstate hubs such as Duluth, Rochester, Rochester and Mankato. Um, added um, recently would be Oakdale, Edina, and Maple Grove. Uh, the city has twice received a legislation, um, mainly for the South Loop around the Mall of America area, but they're very specific sales tax pieces for the, the, the projects there. Um, in 2019, the legislation made some major modifications. Um, and so they moved from local um, governments passing referendums um, and switched it so we have to actually go through legislation first and then take it to the voters. So that move back and forth. So at this point, um, we need to get, uh, if the council is, wants to seek a local option sales tax, we would look to get support from the council on a resolution on the 24th, um, send that out to the tax chairs, both the House and the Senate, and move through the legislative process with that. Then each of the projects will be individually listed on a separate ballot question in the general election, um, should we bring it next November? So each of the projects would be separate. Um, in 2019, eight cities did win um, the approval to add or extend their local option sales tax. So uh, what is coming up next week would be the um, legislative breakfast and Staff are currently working on uh, one pager or one sheet, so both sides, uh, looking through each of the four projects, um, identifying the regional significance of that project, outlining some of the costs and some of the, the pros and of what, what we're moving forward on that. On the 24th, we would have uh, the public comment is what we've been advertising. There is such that advertising that particular um, notice will come out in Thursday's Sun Current for the 24th, and then um, the resolutions 
before the projects would come before the council. Um, then hopefully as soon as those council resolutions are signed, we would get those out to the tax chairs. So we are not even scurrying on the 31st. Everything's done and in place. Um, February through May, council legislators and staff um, would provide the education on the four projects. We would all work together. Uh, several of us would be testifying, at least the mayor, um, Shane, myself, and probably Susan Foss and Diane on the details of some of those projects. All during that period of time, um, a number of questions might be coming through for council to make decisions on. You know, we need to probably uh, finish creating the project, a project charter, and looking at what decisions need to be made where on each of these projects. So um, then June through November, if the council does want to move forward at that point to have the election in November, we would need to uh, continue education of all the community, kind of have a lot more community engagement on the process. And then should um, everything pass, uh, the Department of Revenue would put all of this out and they notify the businesses about the tax changes each year. They only make a tax change on a quarterly basis. So they would make the information out there for those businesses. They would also do the collection and the reporting and the auditing of the tax collection. So that is the process and each of the questions are asked, again, each of the projects are separate. So we have Bloomington Ice Garden at the 32 million Community Health and Wellness Center at 70 million and the Art Center expansion at 33, Duane at 15. Um, we have information um, that we've sent out to council over the years in regards to the extension center for community vitality. They've done the study uh, that we received in July of 21, and that's using 2019 sales tax data. We also have the March 2019 report, which used 2016 data. So uh, one of the questions council asked is how frequently is that data updated? And each year um, around April 1st uh, is the next date that those, those data tables will be updated. So I did include the website link there for that. So 2020 data will be available approximately April 1st of 2022. Um, and then another question was asked on exemptions. So Bloomington is a city agency or a government agency, and then there's some nonprofits that have some sales tax exemptions on very specific things. So the Boy Scouts might have some nonprofit activities. They would all have to follow state statutes in regards to where they are exempt from certain things. Um, there was a question on the 20th also on some of the items that are tax exempt. So um, we just pulled a, a quick list um, again, the link for what is taxable or exempt is on that link. Um, so baby products still will continue to be exempt. Clothes, drugs, um, health products, um, residential utilities, service materials, school meals, textbooks, those type of things will continue to be tax exempt. And then um, part of the also discussion on the 20th was just the math piece of this. The property taxes um, again we can only go so far in the future um, you know we don't know how how prices are going to continue to grow or accelerate so utilizing 2022 data um, if we were to put um, in the 2.75 percent levy increase right now um, for that the monthly median home value will pay 101 dollars and 28 cents if we add 11 million of debt service, that monthly median valued home would go up to $118.86 or an increase of $17.58. Over the year, that would be $211. Under the local option sales tax piece, um, based off of the reports, 25% would be coming from Bloomington residents. Um, approximately $11 million would be collected annually. 25% of that number Two million seven hundred and fifty thousand. We have just over thirty-eight thousand households in Bloomington, so two point seven five divided by the thirty-eight is seventy-two dollars. So there's a, a significant math difference when you look at two hundred and eleven dollars a year versus seventy-two dollars a year. So 
Um, just looking at the map there, if the council had any questions. So our working groups are meeting frequently. Um, the one page for each project is being worked on. Uh, we have the legislative breakfast next Tuesday morning. Again, we have the public comment being advertised for the 24th, the resolutions on the 24th, and we would get the information to the tax chairs before the end of January, our current status. So what um, we'd like to open up here is additional questions, other information the council would like. What, Jamie? If I may, Mr. Mayor and council members, um, I think it's also good just to, every time we talk about this, reiterate why it is that we are uh, considering requesting this from the state legislature and ultimately from Bloomington voters. Um, so we have uh, many demands in our capital improvement plan and many of our city facilities are reaching an age where uh, either significant rehabilitation or reinvestment or replacement is necessary. Uh, we have had discussion with the council over the last several years about the best way to pursue this. And I think there's a, a general consensus that has emerged uh, that we want to reserve our our um, general fund, our general obligation bonds, our charter bond authority for facility reinvestment that is essential for the critical and core services of government that we deliver. And so uh, that prioritizes things like fire station, uh, you know, the addition of uh, the mechanics uh, um, workshop at the, uh, uh, at the public works facility. Uh, so as we, as we look at other uh, assets that we have, uh, we want to look at other uh, revenue sources that are available to lessen the burden of uh, the property taxpayer in Bloomington and still maintain the facilities that we have an obligation to maintain. So the Bloomington Ice Garden, uh, yes, we did some improvements. I referenced those a little bit ago in the discussion. Uh, but we still have significant improvements at that facility that need to be done. The roof needs to be repaired, uh, the mechanical and, and the especially the refrigeration system uh, needs to be replaced. And that's not an option because the actual refrigerant uh, has been um, prohibited moving forward. So we have to replace the refrigeration system there. Uh, one of the rinks there, number three, is uh, an Olympic sheet. It is, uh, it's not... Um, it's not optimal for uh, trying to position the arena for um, uh, tournaments and, and such. And then, uh, you know, the the locker rooms are are um, below you know below standard and needing up upgrades too. So there's significant need at the ice garden. Uh, we already talked about the golf course this evening. Um, the public health facility uh, is a little bit different in that it is. I would say it's it, we would consider it a core. Um, government service. Uh, and it is also providing a regional benefit in that it is the headquarters for the Tri-City Consortium of Richfield, Bloomington, and Dinah uh, public health uh, efforts. And so the, one of the key pieces as Lori walked through this uh, discussion was that uh, the local option sales tax uh, must be utilized for um, projects of a regional nature. Uh, this, the same is true as we look at replacement of the Creekside facility um, that we would want to be positioning that as a community health and wellness center and uh, potentially incorporating the public health into that facility. Uh, and again, using that as a, as a way to serve not just the Bloomington community, but uh, the communities that we serve through our public health uh, services. And then finally, the discussion of the um, expansion of the Bloomington Center for the Arts. Uh, I think on the on the list of projects that we have identified as potentials for uh, the local option sales tax source, that is the one that uh, may fit more in the category of want than need. Uh, but the, the issue that we have had for several years at the Center for the Arts and will continue to have uh, even more so moving into the future is that we are really constrained for um, performance and rehearsal space in our existing facility, uh, in large part 
it's this is a this is a fortunate problem to have is that our our resident tenants of the Bloomington Center for the Arts are extremely um, successful and uh, making sure that we have a space for them in our community uh, which is consistent with why the Bloomington Center for the Arts was developed in the first place is really important moving forward. Uh, so again, all of the projects that we've identified are um, regional in nature. They all um, serve people beyond Bloomington's borders. And so what we've tried to do is identify a funding source that doesn't re rely just on Bloomington taxpayers to pay for them. It would, uh, it would mean that uh, people from outside the community are helping to support these projects. So the research that was done by the Minnesota Extension Service uh, is that um, only about 25% of all of the sales tax revenue generated in Bloomington is actually paid for by Bloomington residents. That means that 75% of the sales tax that's generated here is coming from uh, people outside of Bloomington. And so when you look at this from a, a cost benefit perspective of the Bloomington community, uh, as Lori looked at the numbers there, the median value home impact for these projects would be about $210 per household. The, the impact through a local option sales tax is, is not even a third of that. It's about $72, right? And so what we're trying to do is find uh, the most efficient way to continue to reinvest in our facilities uh, maintain them to the Bloomington standard and to uh, to not burden our taxpayers to the greatest extent possible. Uh, so that's the rationale for why we're doing this. Um, frankly, if it's approved by the legislature and ultimately approved by voters, this is a really good deal for Bloomington residents in that they are able to make sure that we do have facilities that are going to serve the community for a long time and they're going to pay less than what they would if we had to do those facilities through general obligation bonds um, or charter bonds. I'll stop there, Mr. Mayor and Council members, and entertain any questions you might have. Thanks, Thank you, Mr. Uh, so a question regarding the resolution on, on the 24th. What level of detail are, is required for this resolution? Uh, is it, I, I saw the, the, the numbers that you put forward with, for the different projects, but are they is the level of detail as specific as what we saw with the golf course tonight for each of these four projects, or is that kind of an outlier because it's it's further along? How how much detail needs to go into these resolutions? How much information and how much specificity are we looking for by the 24th? Uh, Mayor members, there's a statute that specifically addresses this. It gets it's very specific. A proposed tax rate. I'm sorry, Melissa, we're having, we're having audio issues tonight. I'm having a hard time hearing you as well. You might have to use the big voice for us if you could. Oh, goodness, I know, I know. And I look like I've got like some poltergeist going on periodically as well. Um, the the resolution, the, the contents of the resolution are set forth in state law, uh, 297A.99. It gets very specific. Um, tax rate, how used, documentation, economic benefit, uh, it's quite specific. Um, we've been collecting some samples from some other jurisdictions and um, plan to have that put together and um, ready to go, uh, hopefully posted on the city's website this week. I, I appreciate that. And, and I reason I asked the question, for example, the expansion of the Arts Center here, we really haven't talked about that in depth in a while now. And uh, we've, we've talked about the Ice Garden and, and, the, and, and Dwan certainly more than the other two. But in terms of a um, a replacement for Creekside with the, a, a community center, a public health building. I mean, the, the details for that are back of the napkin at best. And, and I understand that that's where we are. I'm just looking for what level that the yep. legislature is going to need to be able to look at and say, yep, this is, this passes muster for us. We're, we're going to approve this and let Bloomington move forward with it. Yeah. Mr. Mayor and council members, it's a good question. We have to identify the project. We have to identify the cost for the project and we have to be able to uh, demonstrate the number of uh, uh, people beyond the community who will benefit by it. So some sort of, uh, you know, that regional um, benefit estimate. So uh, we, we don't have to have specific design. Um, we, we don't have to be at a certain 
um, stage of design development. Um, and the because these are large projects, they don't all have to occur at the same time. Uh, if the authorization is granted, uh, you would have a couple of years to move forward on it. And a council could cancel the project uh, at a later time if they found that the costs uh, exceeded what that the estimate was, uh, if there wasn't a way to maybe right size the cost for what was approved. Um, so uh, there's, there's still um, steps that happen after the authorization would occur. Got it. And Thanks. part of that is the design um, and, and facility um, development. Understood. That makes more sense now. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Coulter and then Council Member Lohman. Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a few, a uh, couple of quick things here. Um, so I, I have mentioned this before and I mentioned this specifically to, to um, our, <clears throat> excuse me, Parks and Rec Director, but um, for myself, I need more information about specifically how Dwan qualifies as a as a more regional project. I I got some very initial information. Um, I just need more. I need more specific numbers. I I don't doubt that that exists, um, but to me that that's the one I just don't intuitively understand to be a regional asset. Um, so I'm just just to put that on radar. So I'm going to need more information there. The other question that I have is, you know, knowing the legislature as I do and special sessions no longer being special, um, you know, this, I mean, this is an election year, of course, but I, they, there is a, and I'm going to knock on wood, I'm sure I'm not the first person to mention it, but there is a non-zero chance that something happens in a special session after the end of the regular special session at the end of May. And my question is, if it gets to be, you know, June or July, are, are we obligated to, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm still recovering from my cold, obviously, are we obligated to have these questions on the ballot this November? Do we have any discretion as far as when the elections take place? Mr. Mayor and council members, council member Coulter, uh, we, are not obligated to a certain election. Uh, so if it went late, uh, we could um, defer to a, a subsequent election date. There are, if I recall, only four or five uh, dates that are permissible in Minnesota to conduct elections. Uh, and I believe that we can uh, ask that question on any of those dates. The question then is for really for the city council uh, about um, you know, what your desire would be or what you feel is most appropriate in terms of asking a, a referendum question of this nature, um, what what election is most appropriate for it. So my my recollection is you know, based on the, the past ballot questions that we've discussed is that essentially once we decide to have a ballot question, it's just a matter of sending the language to the county. Am I so am I correct that it's basically a similar process once uh, if if the legislature were to approve a bill and it gets signed into law by the governor and so on, then it's just a matter of sending the language to the county. Am I am I correct in that understanding? Uh, yeah, and the city attorney had provided me the statutory reference on this. Is actually it's within a two year period after approval from the um, uh, legislature that we have to get the uh, referendum, and it, it has to be at a general election. So sorry if. It, some of these special election dates uh, doesn't appear would qualify. Okay, thank you. That's 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 good to know. That's helpful. Thank you, yeah. Councilmember Lohman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor and Manager. Uh, so, uh, Mayor or Manager, I heard you uh, say during the presentation, um, you know, you know, here are these uh, different uh, items here, and you've got them listed here, uh, and and so and and. We kind of came upon those and there was also a survey done actually a couple of different surveys i put my hands on it and that list you know they, they sometimes don't uh uh mix together as well as here's here's what the here's what the population wants to see um so help me understand that you know okay 
why, why did we get these ones on this list as opposed to other ones? And I've heard, you know, I've also heard, you know, why not do natural resources? I know I, I've got some emails and some folks who called uh, that helped me understand how we got to these specific items uh, on this list. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman, uh, for a couple of these items, the uh, for three of them especially, the Ice Garden, the Golf Course, and the Center for the Arts, uh, these are not necessarily what we would consider um, core government services. That doesn't mean they're not important um, uh, assets and facilities for serving our community, uh, but when we look at the, the needs within our capital improvement plan and trying to figure out uh, how we are going to uh, uh, do that work in a way that is uh, acceptable and responsible for the taxpayer. Uh, these are items that occurred to us as more quality of life items or amenities that um, we felt trying to identify an alternative revenue source um, was better for the Bloomington property taxpayer. Uh, if we can get the authorization to do so. These facilities also uh, bring in a number of people from outside of our community, which means it meets that test for, um, you know, why, why this type of a funding mechanism is acceptable for these. And most of the other projects, if not all of them in our CIP, um, don't necessarily meet that test. So there was some question about fire stations. Um, in, in a city like ours, it's hard to um, demonstrate regional benefit for replacement of fire stations. Um, you know, there there is uh, uh, cooperation that occurs between municipalities through our, um, uh, our you know, our, our joint use agreements and uh, our mutual aid agreements, um, but that doesn't necessarily rise to that level of regional benefit. These are ones that are actually serving uh, people and the number of people that we can pretty reasonably document beyond Bloomington's borders. Uh, and, and again, the public health piece was um, uh, because it's uh, part of our Tri-City Consortium and it's very easy to make that, that regional benefit. So the, the thing that these projects have in common is that um, they, are, they are very expensive projects in the context of our capital improvement plan and they are projects that um, uh, are regional in nature and qualify for another funding source that would relieve the Bloomington taxpayer of the obligation through our, our regular general obligation bonding authority. I appreciate that distinction because I, I know there's some folks who go, wait, we had a survey here and the survey says you, we should be doing these things here. And then now, you know, the city's putting these, these five items or, you know, depending on how you want to count it, you know, a different number forward and that doesn't kind of compute and so then what i saw in another slide um and where you where you have the loss numbers on one end and then uh the regular tax dollars on the on the, on the other end if we were to do this you know from a math perspective from the property tax you know again median you know once you kind of it, it gets really confusing and really complex fast so i want to be careful as i say this but the way I understand it is it's roughly around $200, you know, uh, where if we were to do this, depending on how all this were, were to work out and what that looks like and what you do, maybe it's around 200, maybe it's a little bit more than that. Um, and then if we were to do this, uh, you know, through this loss uh, piece, you would be uh, uh, on average or the median would have 72. So we're talking about a roughly a hundred and thirty dollar hundred fifty dollar depending on how you do this difference uh you know from a taxpayer uh perspective um so i just want to be sure that i understand that number as we kind of move forward and then uh that number drops if uh if, if we were to get approval from the legislature it would go off to the legislature and then the referendum comes back and a taxpayer would have the opportunity uh to vote on that and that number may come down uh, from that further if there is a support for each one of those uh, items. Do I understand that correct? Do I have uh, understand that? Okay. If, if Mayor, that's Council members, Council Member Lohman, let me just real quickly answer that. Yes, you are understanding that correctly. Uh, if, if voters were to uh, only approve a couple of these projects, then the, uh, the, the amount of necessary um, sales tax generated would go down. Um, and so it it would either be 
uh, a half sentence for a shorter period of time, that's the most likely thing is it would be it would be the similar amount. It would just be for fewer years, I think, is probably the likely way that that work, would work out. And I'm looking at the CFO and she's nodding her head. So I think that that's uh, correct. Um, and if I could, Council Member Lohman, the other point that you made earlier, um, the question about other projects that might be eligible and interest in some natural resource uh, management projects and why those weren't considered. Uh, there are a couple issues here. Um, one, we don't have a defined natural resource management project in our CIP. Um, we have a micro business at the city that is going to look at developing those projects. Um, and I expect that we're going to see some coming forward over the course of the next uh, one to two years. Um, but there isn't anything that's been in the CIP the, the way that these projects have been for the last several years. Uh, secondly, it's not clear that natural resource management would be uh, a, a permissible use. There are um, park improvement projects. Other cities, uh, even our neighboring city of Edina, was approved by the legislature last year for park improvement projects. Or there is a contiguous trail. So some folks have asked, could you do this for um, some of these trail improvements that you referenced, Council Member Lohman, that residents indicated in surveys they are really interested in seeing our, our trail network um, built out more. So yes, you could use it for contiguous trails. Um, that that would be an eligible expenditure. But what I'm hearing though is, you know, some of these other ones, There's there's been discussion at the council level and there's been more uh, maturity, if you will, uh, with these items, whereas it, you know we you know we know we've got to work on that natural resources piece, and that uh, that might be a, a, a heavier lift. Maybe down the line we might look at that. So I just wanted to get clarification. I know there were some questions out there um, about that, and then um, I think the last piece that I wanted to clarify was around the questions I asked before. Uh, and I appreciate that staff uh, came back uh, not only with this math piece here, but also uh, with some of the taxable items. The thing that I'm very concerned about. Um, uh, with this, if those folks were on fixed income and those particularly who don't have the opportunity uh, to maybe get out and drive like I can, uh, you know, it kind of limits that. And so I looked at some of those those items, you know, around food and that type of thing. Those don't seem to be, if you're getting the, the natural ingredients, don't seem to be as, you know, it, it won't be taxed in this particular thing. So I feel pretty confident now. Uh, af after having had a look at that, that that won't has big, have a big as an impact. Certainly, there'll be an impact, but uh, it won't be as big as, as I'm thinking. And, 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 and in fact, if you look at it, this is if we're going to do these items uh, and taxpayers support this, that would be the more responsible way to move forward in my in this this council member's opinion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If I may, and council members and council member Loman, I appreciate you making that point too. And so I, I would um, appreciate the opportunity to expand on a little bit the question that council member Loman asked at the previous council meeting had to do with what's referred to as the regressive nature of sales taxes um, versus uh, property tax, which has historically been a little bit more progressive. So what does that mean? Um, regressive uh, taxes mean that they uh, tend to have a greater impact on people who are uh, less able to pay for those taxes. So in other words, uh, people in the lower income strata uh, uh, are more adversely affected. And that has been true historically of the sales tax um, because it is a level number. Everybody pays that six and a half percent base or you know, whatever it is right now. Um, whether you make $30,000 a year or you make $300,000 a year, you're paying the same rate. And so that's referred to as regressive because that um, has less of an impact to a higher income person. In Minnesota, property taxes have uh, historically been progressive in that the more the value of the property increases, the more your property tax is going to increase. Uh, and it used to be that the tax classifications actually had more tiering um, based on the value. Uh, about 20 years ago, uh, the reform of the property tax classification process um, really lessened those tiers and um, that meant that it became less progressive. So I think if somebody's concerned about sales tax being regressive, um, the fact that it doesn't change uh, 
the status of things like food, clothing, um, and uh, baby products, which are not taxable, and they can't become taxable under local option sales tax, that doesn't change. And when you look at the math here of property tax versus sales tax, I think that that concern about regressive impact is um, is washed out. So. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. A uh, couple quick ones here. Um, the sales tax report that we had before, uh, uh, we noted that. At 25% of the sales tax was residents that live in Bloomington, 75% people outside of it. Um, and I, it was been a couple of years since I've looked at that report. Do we recall if there was any information about like nearby residents that may change buying behavior versus farther afield uh, visitors that, you know, is, especially come to the Mall of America or stay at the hotel for a, a meeting with one of our amazing companies in the area or something like that. Was that broken down in there? Um, Mr. Mayor and council members, council member Nelson, I don't recall any discussion or analysis of um, behavior change as a result of taxing policy. Um, it, I haven't been able to identify any good studies of where local option sales tax have been implemented. Uh, to to see if they had some sort of an economic impact in those communities, uh, we can continue to do that research. Uh, to my knowledge, there there isn't research from Minnesota Extension Service or elsewhere that that documents that. I went to a diner and bought something for my daughter's birthday, and I think they implemented it. So, one anecdotal <laughs> tidbit. So, but that that's where the store was. Um, is it possible in terms of the questions um, to put forth in terms of projects to have options on those projects? I know when we looked at um, what we wanted to do with the community center at Creekside, we had multiple versions of that. Uh, is it possible to put all of those versions to figure out, do you want this? Which of these would you prefer? Uh, to to individuals, or is that not allowed by state statute? Um, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Nelson, uh, I'll look to City Attorney or Chief Financial Officer uh, to correct me if I'm wrong on this, but my understanding is that uh, what, what you're seeking from the uh, legislature's authorization for the uh, maximum amount to be spent on a project. And if it comes in at less than that, whether it's because um, the design or the cost of construction or um, you know the option for the extent of the project was reduced, I think all of those things are okay as long as you're not exceeding the uh, maximum allowable amount based on the authorization. Um, and then just a quick follow-up. So if you had a question in there that said, hey, we'd maximally authorize you know, $1 and what, is there any way to put on a ballot? Would you prefer, you know, one dollar, the seventy-five cent option, the fifty cent option, or something like that, just to get, you know, people to actually vote on which of those things they wanted? I'm not saying that's a good idea or a bad idea. I'm just, is that even possible? I, uh, my sense is, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Nelson, is. Um, that probably wouldn't be possible, but I'd need to do more research into that because we're um, we're asking for a specific amount. So it would be that half cent. And um, I think when you have a referendum that gets into too many choices, it becomes a, a pretty dicey proposition. All right, that's fine. That's Kind of what I thought. I, I just wanted to make sure I understood it. So um, thank you. That's all my questions. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councilmember Nelson, you were asking a line of questioning similar to something I was asking a little bit ago, too, which was, you know, um, what, how are we going to, where in the timeline, I guess, is the place where we can have the conversation with the community to understand what they're what their 
tolerances for you know these these projects, if you will. Um, you know, some will never want any of it. I get that, but you know, to your point, if there was option A or option B, and option A was one dollar and option B was eighty cents, all things being equal, could could we get a sense from the community about which one they wanted before we constructed the language on the ballot that that they would then vote on? Uh, I don't know if that's possible or not, but I, I assume we could try to get anything from the community in terms of a feeler on that if we had the details. I think Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro, the, the important thing when we do go to uh, the referendum, uh, if we get there, is to be able to communicate clearly what the project is, right? And to the extent that it, it has some measure of community support, for a specific option is going to provide more clarity for voters. Uh, so when we talked about, for example, with the golf course, going back and doing more community engagement about the various options, the reason that we'd wanna be doing that is making sure that we're putting a fo forward a project um, that fits the, the wants and the needs of the users uh, and, and of the community. So, um, you know, if, there, if that means that an option doesn't um, equal the amount that we have identified here, that's okay. I think what we're trying to do is just set the threshold for what the maximum amount is going to be, and then we'd have to make sure that we uh, fit ourselves within those constraints. Uh, my second question is um, is kind of just a maybe a, um, a thought experiment of sorts. Um, as we think about implementing this uh, local option sales tax, I'm wondering if there's any, if there's any way to exempt individuals from that. And I don't mean um, uh, at the individual level, but um, oftentimes there are um, options for things like a senior discount card or other stuff like that that you can find where if you're a Bloomington resident over the age of 65, for example, you can show your card and then maybe the system doesn't tax you for the local sales tax or something like that. I want to throw in just the idea that we might come up with some creative ways to um, to offset some of the concerns people have around um, the burden that this does place on folks, for specifically folks with, you know, limited or, or fixed income. Um, so I, I, I don't know if that's something you've thought about at all, um, but if there has been discussions, I'd love to hear them. And if not, um, you know, as we as we get there, maybe we, we can look into that and what the cost implications are of that, right? Because I understand that for every $72 we don't get from a resident, we got to find it somewhere else. I get that part. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro, we have not had discussion about that, at least at a staff level. I think the, the complication there is that the state of Minnesota regulates and uh, controls the collection of sales tax. And so having some sort of a local, um, uh, whether you call it a preferred buyer or a um, specified group uh, um, uh, exception, would probably be extremely difficult to administer because the the directions for how sales tax is calculated goes out to all of the uh, merchants from the Department of Revenue. It's not a city directed uh, issue. And so I'm, I'm guessing that that possibility does not exist. So, so just to clarify that you mean that um, they code their POS systems, right? Their point of sale systems based on the, the, Reven the Department of Revenue requirements and they don't necessarily, I mean, they're not even all the same system, right? There's like 9,000 choices. So they probably don't even have the ability to, um, I don't know, discount or stop the code or whatever it is. I'm, I'm just wondering if that's what you meant by that. Essentially. We can do a little bit more research, but yes, that's basically what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, um, you know, just a, just a thought to, to kind of put something together. If, if we can come up with something that's interesting, um, I know that there are lots of folks out there who who probably would love to see these things happen and, and then are at the same time understanding the burden that we're placing on them. So thank you. Appreciate it. So Mr. Verbrugge, you mentioned if we get to referendum, and it made me think, if we get to referendum, who writes the ballot questions? Is there a specific way we have to write them or is it up to our interpretation? And I only ask given the adventures we've had with ballot questions over the past couple of years around here. Mr. Mayor, I'm gonna to defer to the city attorney on that uh, since she's been researching the resolutions. Um, my guess is that the city 
uh, would write the ballot question, but uh, there's there's probably some parameters that are required. Ms. Mandershed? Uh, Mayor, members, I'm confident that there are parameters. Um, I have not researched that question yet, but I most definitely will be uh, looking into that. Uh, we have lots of samples from many jurisdictions. Uh, it does, the. there are parameters for what it needs to include, if my recollection serves me, you know, the percent, what it's used for, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a bit of a cadence to it that will follow. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Lohman, Councilmember... Nelson, are those new hands? I'm assuming they're not. Uh, Councilmember Lohman, new hand? My, my, mine's a new hand. Councilmember Lohman. Um, sure. Yeah, uh, so just on that line of, of uh, discussion that uh, Councilmember uh, D'Alessandro was uh, uh, bringing forward, um, I, I wonder, I know that at the state level, the lost sale uh, items are collected, but at the local level, wouldn't we have some indication of where folks are at? Um, and could we build a program around that piece of it uh, moving forward, as opposed to trying to trying to go to the the you know, Minnesota Revenue Service? Um, you know, from our from our property tax standpoint, wouldn't we have a way of 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 classifying those individuals and being able to 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 put together a program, City Manager? Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman, were you asking on the property tax piece if we're able to do that? Well, I mean, I'm assuming that, it maybe this is the wrong assumption to make, and so this is my question to you, is that wouldn't those people be the same that are, you know, in that category in the property tax standpoint uh, who are struggling from the, that standpoint uh, of a fixed income? That are from that from the law standpoint if you're looking at that, that isn't that the same i mean it's not i mean it's not you know mutually exclusively the same but i mean they're going to be about the same amount of people you know it's going to be the same demographics of folks and so then rather than trying to do your program based on on what you would do at the, the revenue service because i don't think there'd be any way for us to collect that data or that information but couldn't we do it based on our on our on our, on our property tax um uh piece uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman. So we do have, there's a property tax refund program or rebate program, uh, and that is an income-based program. Um, we do not administer that piece. So we actually don't know about the eligibility qualifications of any of our property taxpayers, because that also gets uh, taken care of through the Minnesota Department of Revenue. Um, so we actually have uh, very little knowledge of um, the income eligibility of any of our taxpayers un unless they're specifically offering that information to us. So if they were to offer it to us, then that would be a completely different uh, uh, story. But as it, as it were, the only thing that we collect or have information about would be from a property standpoint, it, nothing beyond that, we would be locked into that, right? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Lohman, we don't actually collect on the property tax that is uh, distributed to us from uh, a higher level of government that actually collects those taxes. And, and the other important piece too is that, um, you know, the, there's a state statute that uh, provides for a property tax refund program. Uh, to our knowledge, there is not a similar state statute that provides for a sales tax refund program. I figure it out. <laughs> but Those I are all I, great I, questions. I would be interested to see if there is a way to uh, uh, to do as asked before. Uh, if there's a way to mitigate that some way, but uh, if, if it's a reporting issue, I can understand how that would probably never happen. But uh, um, and, and the only reason why I ask that is that in some of the other programs where we talk about equity, um, uh, that would be an interesting piece to be able to fold into. Um, our, our data analysis and how we conduct some of our other programs when we talk about equity um, from that perspective. So um, that, that's why I'm pressing more on this. I understand that may be difficult to pull off uh, by the time we try to roll this thing out, but uh, I'm just interested in that piece. So. Council Member Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, kind of a, a similar line of thinking, I guess I would just add that although this isn't a solution for every single person that's paying a sales tax, if we were to um, get this approved and move forward, I mean, I think it does speak to the need to continue to have, um, you know, sliding scale 
fee options for residents in Bloomington who may want to use these facilities but may need some financial assistance. And so even though it's not on the front end that can help impact everybody that's paying sales tax, again, it could be a way. I mean, I think it just, to me, it would be important to continue to maintain um, where we have them currently, those sliding scale fees, and then if we don't have them for, like, the Center for the Arts, for example, and I, I, I have no idea if we do or, <laughs> or don't, um, are there options so that people who will be paying more of their income in sales tax, um, in theory, uh, could also have more access to the facilities themselves that are being rebuilt. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. So here we are on January 10th. We don't have a meeting next Monday night because of Martin Luther King Day. That's the 17th. And then our next meeting, of course, is the 24th, which is where we would discuss this. So if you could uh, step us through between now and the 24th, the information that will go out, uh, what we'll, we'll, we will have in our hands, uh, what will be, be presented publicly, whether it's on the website or through a communications some sort. If you could just lead me up to the 24th, please. Sure. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, communications will be putting out information. We will have uh, info posted for our um, uh, hearing notice page on the website because uh, council indicated that they wanted to take public comment on this item before acting upon it. Uh, so that information will be available and uh, ideally we will have it posted by this Thursday uh, to try and meet that 10 day standard. Even though we have not uh, put it in the newspaper, it will be uh, available. Or is it in the newspaper, Melissa? It is in the newspaper. It's in the newspaper. It should run this Thursday. Okay, that's right. So then we'll have it up on the website too. So. Uh, folks will be able to see some of that information and have a landing spot on the website to see more. And just to be clear, it's on the notices page. So the city's website then slash notices where all the other public hearing notices are. And I think as we've talked about, this would be, I think, a good op opportunity for us, as we've talked about in the past, to get, uh, you know, talking points or information, a one pager basically to council. So if and when we get questions either in person or over the phone or via social media that we we, we understand and we're, we're all, we're, we're saying the correct information in response to the questions that we get and we're, we're answering again in the same way and correctly. That would be helpful, I think. You bet. Right. We will have that, uh, we will have this done by this Friday, Mr. Mayor and Council members, um, so that you have it so that it's available about roughly the same time that the public will be seeing the notices. That would be very helpful, I think. Thank you. Council, anything additional on this? Any additional questions? I'm not seeing hands go up. Uh, so uh, a good discussion and I think good information here. This is, it, I, I, it's been an intriguing thought to me for a while now as a way that we could enhance our community amenities with uh, and, and limit the cost to Bloomington taxpayers. And this would be an interesting way to do it. And I think we could get, um, we, we could take a big burden off of our CIP with some um, amenities and some items that I think would be uh, very good to have in, in the city of Bloomington and would definitely benefit our residents and people across the, the region uh, in a lot of different ways. So uh, interesting discussion and looking forward to continuing this one. Thank you all. Our final item of the evening is item 8.4, our city council policy and issue update. Mr. Verbrugge. Uh, Mr. Mayor and council members, uh, no specific issues to bring back to you. Just wanna reiterate the discussion that was had uh, earlier in the meeting uh, and uh, you know the information that we're getting from our public health staff, uh, Dr. Kelly and uh, others, uh, for people to really take serious the situation that we are in currently with COVID. And we are experiencing community transmission like nothing that has occurred in the almost two years that uh, we have been living uh, with uh, COVID. And uh, you know, the, f the fact is that the Omicron um, variant uh, does appear to be less severe than uh, previous variants, um, but it does transmit much more easily and so the number of cases right now 
uh, are continuing to strain our, um, our, our, our systems, the, the healthcare system, hospitals, uh, first responders, all of those are being dramatically affected because it's a math problem. Yes, it may not be as severe uh, as previous variants, but when you have um, exponential numbers of cases above those, it is still driving uh, real strain on our system. So you know, it's not just about protecting your family and protecting um, yourself. Uh, all those are really important still, but we're, we're talking about the ability of our, our healthcare systems to continue to function and our first rep responder systems being able to continue to function. Um, and, you know, for the city to be able to continue delivering city services, uh, you know, we, we had, I think, more than 30 um, staff members out, uh, which is the most that we've ever had. Uh, it, it's getting to be a real challenge, not just for Bloomington. This is, this is being experienced all over the place. So please take, take seriously the warnings from the CDC and the Minnesota Department of Health and our own local public health folks. Uh, and, and please follow all the best practices and protocols uh, to make sure that we limit the transmission of, of uh, COVID. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Coulter and then Council Member Nelson. Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. I just have one thing, and that is that I am uh, having my first community conversation event of 2022. I put these um, on hold kind of during the campaign. Uh, so I'm really excited to to start them up again, and this will be entirely virtual again. I had hoped that it would be in person, but um, obviously that's just not the, the wise choice at the moment. Um, and that will be January 20th, the evening of January 20th from 6 until 7.30. I, um, I will be using the city's Zoom account, which means folks do need to register in advance. And I just got that registration link today. Um, so I will be circulating that as well, and I can certainly send that out to, to folks who are interested. Uh, folks can email me, uh, call me. I can send it out to, to other folks if they want to uh, push it out to their, their communications as well. But um, I mean, these are always really, really good events, chance to for folks to just sort of directly ask questions. I'm, I'm really excited about it. Again, that's January 20th from 6 till 7.30 in the evening. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just have one item. I uh, just wanted to bring up uh, and maybe congratulate and uh, tell people that I'm excited that Eric Johnson, Dr. Johnson, who was uh, Community Development Director, I don't know, probably got the title wrong there, but uh, he's he's coming back to Minnesota. And uh, he's going to be the CEO of Aon. He, uh, he he helped us immensely with the Opportunity Housing Ordinance, and uh, was a pretty innovative individual. And just very excited to have him back in our community, and hope that the city is able to uh, reach out and work with him and um, see what ideas he brings. So I uh, I guess uh, the grass wasn't greener in Dallas. So he's he's back here now. Um, looking forward to that. So just wanted to congratulate him and say that I've reached out to him personally and try to find a time to get together with him. But it's uh, a really good thing for our region, a, a very innovative individual in terms of providing access to housing for families and individuals that uh, are struggling. So. Thank you, Council Member. Agree completely. Looking forward to having him back in town. Council Member Lohman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I wanted to just uh, bring up that uh, in the on the 24th of January, uh, there is going to be a, uh, a resolution that is coming for uh, uh, this council. And I wanted to just kind of give a heads up uh, both to the council and also to the community generally about uh, yeah, we have a it's a climate um, uh, resolution. Uh, and uh, we'd like you guys to consider that and, and to look at that. I know the Sustainability Commission and a number of other communities have been looking uh, at that and some of the things that have been happening uh, across um, our, our city and our community uh, around the environment uh, and that we need to take those things seriously. And so when that comes up, I'm just hoping that uh, you'll have an opportunity to read that through. And if you've got questions, certainly uh, uh, read through that that resolution that uh, I'm hoping that you'll be able to, 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 to consider um, on that particular day when that comes before the council. 
um, around the, our, our current climate situation. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, I wanted to report to the Council and to the members of the community also, I was at a meeting today which was an extension of our Regional Council of Mayors meeting and it included uh, a number of folks. It was a meeting of about 100 people actually and it included uh, elected officials, police chiefs, uh, state and county elected officials, basically all in the room trying to talk our way through, trying to figure out what to do with this surge in crime that is not just here in Bloomington but across the Twin Cities. And uh, I, I do want to report it was, a, it was a good meeting, it was a productive meeting. I can't say that we, we solved crime in this, in this two hours that we were together, but I think it was a good and productive first step and first meeting uh, that I hope to be uh, the first of many meetings probably not of the whole group, but of rather of uh, subgroups of this uh, larger group to try and craft ways that we can approach and attack this, this issue that we've got before us right now. Uh, I, there were at least, I think, 50 mayors in the room from across the Twin Cities. We had uh, um, County Attorney Freeman, County Attorney Choi, we had Mayor Fry, we had Sheriff Hutchinson, we had uh, the Commissioner of Corrections, uh, Paul Schnell, so we had people in the room who could speak to these issues and who could talk to things. And we had a very good discussion about a number of things. We agreed on a lot of things. I think that um, at least needed to be considered and pushed forward to, to try and get our arms around some of the issues, including uh, a, a more aggressive prosecution of cases, especially, especially for repeat offenders. And I think the general consensus was the repeat offenders were the issue across the Twin Cities, that the, the number, the small number of people committing the large number of crimes is a, is a significant issue. And there needs to be issues, uh, there needs to be work done there. We talked about revisiting the bail reform, that, um, that there should be, if in, in the cases of violent crimes, the, the perpetrator should be before a judge. It shouldn't be a sign and release. There should be a revisiting of the bail reform uh, to stop the sign and release warrants for crimes of violence, whatever they are to reevaluate juvenile detention, uh, to, to look for opportunities to collaborate. And probably the universal thing that we heard from so many people was the support and respect for our police and for our law enforcement uh, at, at every level. And so it was, as I said, it was a good meeting, what I expect to be the first of many meetings. One of the recommendations that I brought forward was that while this was a good group and we talked about creation of other groups and other possibilities about how to continue this discussion, uh, I belong to a group that's called the Hennepin County Criminal Justice Coordinating Committee and suggested that the HJCC be the group that kind of takes this on, especially for Hennepin County. It includes elected officials, it includes county, uh, city elected officials, county uh, prosecutors, judges, a number of different people who could approach this from a number of different ways. And I think it makes sense to try and take this on with existing structures that rather than trying to create newer structures or, or recreate structures and so that, can, that discussion will continue. We have a meeting of the CJCC upcoming and I'll bring this, gonna bring this forward for the discussion of the group to see where we can move forward with that. And um, it was, it, as I said, it was a good meeting and I think the, uh, it wasn't, there weren't always, uh, we weren't always in agreement and I think there was some, uh, there was a back and forth about how best to do some of these things, but uh, respect greatly the, the opinions brought forward by the chiefs of police respect the folks uh, who are trying to do the work to try and take care of this uh, from an elected perspective and from a prosecutorial perspective. And I think we've just gotta make sure that we continue working together to put this all together and try and find a way forward to make, to make inroads across the entire Twin Cities region, not just here in Bloomington, not just Minneapolis. It's not a specific area problem. It affects all of us and, and the solutions that will, will benefit and affect all of us as well. So I'll talk more about it when I, uh, uh, in my council minute this week, when I have a little bit better time to kind of organize my thoughts, I literally uh, came right from there over to here, and so I've, I'm working off of my, uh, my my note cards right now, trying to remember exactly what we said. But to put the, uh, the the specific messages together, I'll have that prepared, and I think in a better way by Wednesday for our, the council minute. So, if you have any questions on it, let me know. I'm happy to 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 talk more or to talk to you one on one about what we talked about and how the meeting went. So, Councilmember Nelson. 
Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I would love to have more information. I, and I'd also just like to thank you. I know this isn't the only thing you've been doing with regards to the issue of crime in our community and working with our, uh, you know, just adjacent uh, um cities and municipalities and and uh chief hartley and all the hard work that he has done in the police department but i i would love to have a little bit of an update on any ideas that are out there um anything the council should or can do to support uh things that will help there that we might be seeing coming forward just a little visibility into those would be helpful but again Thank you. I, I know this is an issue that you've been working on, not just with this meeting, but with, you know, a number of continuing things over uh, the last year. And um, our police department, as we always uh, recognize, is second to none. So thank you to everyone there and um, very much appreciate the efforts. Absolutely, Councilmember Nelson. Thank you. Thanks for your, your comments. Uh, I, I will definitely keep you updated as, as this moves forward and as proposals come forward about specifics that we might be able to do on a council level, a city by city level. We'll certainly uh, have those discussions. Absolutely. Anything else, council? Hearing none? May Mayor, oh, I'm sorry. should I make the mention I mentioned before now, just to be official about it? making sure that our resident who stayed all day for our meeting, thank you very much, gets a follow-up on his specific issue. There you go. Thank you, Council Member. I thank knew I'd forgotten something. Thank I appreciate you. that. Yes. We'll make sure somebody reaches out to you, sir, and in case there's a specific issue we can't address for you. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you for reminding me. Now, with no further business to bring forward, Council, I would look for a motion to adjourn tonight's meeting. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Martin, a second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to adjourn this evening's meeting. No further council discussion. Mr. Brillard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lowman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries 7 0. We are officially adjourned. Thank you to staff for the information. Good discussion tonight. Thank you to the council for a great discussion. Thank you for, for sticking it out with us until almost 10.30. Appreciate your being here tonight. So thank you all very much. Everybody have a great evening. Stay warm. <laughs>